Even with the growth in digital commerce, the store still continues to remain the temple of the brand. Now more than ever, consumers expect to get what they want when they take the effort to actually visit this temple. Omni One is designed as a unified interface to equip the store staff with all the powers required to make each journey fulfilling for the customer. Many customers used to walk away out of my store due to lack of options. This used to be huge loss to sales. Customers had a lot of queries which we didn't have answers to, like finding the right size and their favorite color. Because of Omni, there is increase in store's performance, mine as well. Now with the help of Omni, we have access to the entire brand's inventory. And now we have answers to all our customers. Customers these days are very confused with fashion trends and new colors. They expect us to help them out. With the help of new technology, I have an access for new themes, best color combinations, which I can suggest through my iPad. We are no more a store staff. We are now a fashion consultant. There are three secret sources to this approach. Number one, to defragment the store supply. Number two, to integrate the online and offline demand into the store. And number three is to own your customer, their data, to react to their likes and dislikes. With the help of Omni, we can take orders and fulfill them at the same time within a click. The role of our store has changed and now my store has become Omni Channel Distribution Center. My customers can now give to their distant friends and relatives by simply placing an order through this platform. In the last one year, some of the brands have seen an increase of seven to eight times in ordering on the Omni platform generating an additional $30 million of revenue for them. The customer has made the journey to the store. You've empowered the store staff to engage and serve the customer in the best way possible. You've also digitized the customer, and for the first time, you're capturing the customer's data in the store. Now the questions arise. Can your store staff continue the customer journey beyond the store? Can they engage with online audiences and drive them back into the store? Can your stores reduce the inventory in the system by doubling up as fulfillment centers? This is the power of Omni and the virtuous cycle it creates. Even with the growth in digital commerce, the store still continues to remain the temple of the brand. Now more than ever, consumers expect to get what they want when they take the effort to actually visit this temple. Omni One is designed as a unified interface to equip the store staff with all the powers required to make each journey fulfilling for the customer. Many customers used to walk away out of my store due to lack of options. This used to be huge loss to sales. Customers had a lot of queries which we didn't have answers to like finding the right size and their favorite color. Because of Omni, there is increase in store's performance, mine as well. Now with the help of Omni, we have access to the entire brand's inventory. And now we have answers to all our customers. Customers these days are very confused with fashion trends and new colors. They expect us to help them out. With the help of new technology, I have an access for new themes, best color combinations, which I can suggest through my iPad. We are no more a store staff. We are now a fashion consultant. There are three secret sources to this approach. Number one, to defragment the store supply. Number two, to 
integrate the online and offline demand into the store. And number three is to own your customer, their data, to react to their likes and dislikes. With the help of Omni, we can take orders and fulfill them at the same time within a click. The role of our store has changed and now my store has become Omni Channel Distribution Center. My customers can now give to their distant friends and relatives by simply placing an order through this platform. In the last one year, some of the brands have seen an increase of seven to eight times in ordering on the Omni platform, generating an additional $30 million of revenue for them. The customer has made the journey to the store. You've empowered the store staff to engage and serve the customer in the best way possible. You've also digitized the customer, and for the first time, you're capturing the customer's data in the store. Now the questions arise. Can your store staff continue the customer journey beyond the store? Can they engage with online audiences and drive them back into the store? Can your stores reduce inventory in the system by doubling up as fulfillment centers? This is the power of Omni and the virtuous cycle it creates. Hello. Am I audible to everyone? Good morning. Uh, yes, Ekta, it's a good sound check. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. A uh, very good morning to you all. And myself, Ekta Dubey, and on behalf of the Brunalytics team and our title partner, Omni, powered by Arvind Internet, we welcome you all and thank you for being part of our webinar, E-Commerce Revolution 2020. Now, before we start the webinar, there are a few guidelines quickly I would like to highlight and make you people aware of. Requesting all the attendees to be on mute when the speakers are taking the session. There would be a Q&A after each session where the attendees can ask the questions to any speakers they need to. The guidelines are you need to raise your hands, unmute yourself on your video, introduce yourself, your name, company, designation, and put your question to the concerned speaker. So to start with, first, I would like to introduce our title partner, Omni, powered by Urban Internet. Omni, India's leading omni-channel retail enablement platform built by retail practitioners and industry insiders. They provide customer journeys as a service, reimagining better journeys for your evolved customer base. They create customer journeys that are unified by a single backend and AI-powered omni-channel platform that integrates all demand channels that a retailer might be using utilizes inventory in the most cost and effective time effective manner and streamlines first and last mile logistics to a minimal drop rate. They also extend APA, their partners 24 by 7 support for the store, customer queries, tech support so that the retail transformation is complete at every level. Now, before we start, a little highlight on the webinar. With the onset of the pandemic, the e-commerce has remarkably spiked across the globe and will only get bigger and better as the year moves on. New technologies are definitely playing a vital role in achieving that. Now, the e-commerce industry is always on a ride to the wave of popularity and industry is all geared up to pick up few challenges and they are in for a long bull run. Now, the webinar would highly focus on understanding the overall post-COVID scenario of the e-commerce industry and its overall impact on the customer experience. Also, one would learn the strategies on how to reconnect and communicate with your customers and adapt to the new tastes and expectations. So to start with the first keynote session, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Umesh Krishna K, Director of Marketing, Swiggy. To speak about him, his experience spans automotive and e-commerce with past half decade being spent on Ola and Swiggy, seeing through crucial periods of brand building and growth. Umesh is an omni-channel marketer and ardent believer in the integration of data and design and building the right marketing strategy. 
He has worked on over 100 commercials, including the iconic ads from the houses of Bajaj Auto and Swiggy. He's going to share his insights on from the expert's lens, unleashing the challenges and the opportunities of COVID-19 on e-commerce related. Over to you, Umesh, to start your presentation. Thank you. Yes, Umesh, you can start with your presentation. Am I audible? Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Ekta. Uh, wonderful to connect with all of you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I would kick off right away. I know that we um, have a very power-packed session today and uh, would like to get this started uh, right away. Yeah, so let me just share my screen and we're good to go right after. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Sorry. Yes, Umesh. All right. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful to have uh, all of you again and uh, here again. One. Um, okay. So we're going to kick off. Cool. So here's the topic that is set out in the agenda. Uh, it's not something that I would need um, to explain to all of you. I'm pretty sure that um, you know, you've all been through this, you know, personally, professionally, um, if you're a business owner, you may have owned some of this up and experienced it firsthand. If you're a part of any function, whether it's marketing, supply ops, I'm very sure that there has been some deep impact of the pandemic in the way you work, um, in the way you live, right? So um, I don't think the topic needs a lot of introduction, a lot of discussion. I'll get into this right away. And before that, I'll just um, share a short brief about myself. So I am a director of marketing with Swiggy. Uh, I joined Swiggy about four mm -hmm. years back when Swiggy was in its um, second year post inception. Obviously, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, the last four or five, four years or so working in a category, which is fairly new at that point of time, establishing it, growing it quickly, reaching various cities in India. Uh, and obviously, I think the last one year has been the most challenging. Um, now, functionally, I handle a lot of functions or work that spans digital production, uh, media, brand, etc. But I think there's an easier way that I can um, give an introduction. So uh, you guys know this uncle. I'm pretty sure that most of you would have seen him, um, you know, in your television, uh, or he might pop up while you're watching your favorite content on uh, YouTube or OTT. Um, so I am part of the team. My team works on this to uh, bring this out to you guys. So this is fundamentally what we do from a very customer point of view and all the work that goes underneath to get the tech stack ready to the media plan ready to get this out to consumers. And I am also responsible for some of those recurring YouTube ads that you may get. Uh, and I'm very sure that some of you will be getting it a little more frequently or maybe in the past got it a little more frequently than you would have wanted. So part responsibility there also. Cool. So I'll just um, dive into the topic. And if you notice the words, this is a subtext, right? Rethink, restart, and reshape. Very often, these are words that really prompts you to take stock of where you are, uh, unlearn, relearn, learn new skills. And very often, the hardest task for management or organization or an individual. And we'll start off with a little bit of con um, context setting. Now, these are the two numbers. I assume most of you are able to figure out what these are without a title. This is basically the GDP growth of India or rather the degrowth of India over the past couple of quarters. So officially we are in a recession and the news is out. Now, what, how does, what does this mean to us in a much more um, you know, uh, easy to decipher manner? And this gives a little bit of perspective almost half of our households are earning less than uh, they did a year ago, right? Investments across businesses have dipped. Despite the unlock, even in May, more than half of the businesses experienced some sort of shutdown. Maybe it's due to fear of infection, maybe it's due to a business change, maybe it's due to lack of customers. So obviously it's a scenario where, you know, it's, it's unprecedented. We have not seen something of this sort in years. 
and in the context of e-commerce in the context of uh, all of this something that one concept that uh, we are discussing a lot in the current um, conference is that of digital transformation um, fairly common fairly overused sometimes under appreciated um, term i'll split this into two segments to um, quickly drive the conversation now digital um, here i mean everything that is very domain specific right um, so here you know there was a time when everything was discussed as offline versus online whether it's a sales process whether it's a marketing process payment anything and everything right or even the basic consumer behavior so when i started out in ola for example i instantly started in a grocery division it was incredible how many people told us that hey why would i want to go vegetable buy vegetables online i can get it uh, why i can get it at the store and i want to understand i want to understand what i buy right versus today you know how many of our e-commerce services are penetrated right um you would have marketing teams where there's an online marketing manager and a traditional marketing manager now i don't think if you really think you are one of them i think you're probably a little bit of a dinosaur and i'm very sure that all of you would agree that everything's digital and or everyone has to think digitally because the consumer the economy uh, everything's digital now right it's about how much of that have you imbibed into your business how much have you changed so i don't think there is a lot of debate around this friend but where a lot of um, discussions should happen is on the transformation the process the perspective the thinking the leadership aspect of all of this right and sometimes it's very uh, misunderstood very much misunderstood treated as a jargon but there's so much relevance if you reflect on how we have performed in the last 8 to 9 months um and i'm fairly clear that when you listen to all the experts who have assembled today to share their point of view you will get great insights practical insights on this front whether you are from supply marketing sales or you if you operate entirely in the domain of technology now let's reflect a little bit in terms of let's start consumer first like we always say and uh, let's reflect a little bit on the consumer behavior and this is over the last one year or so something that's anticipated when something of this magnitude sets in is people getting into a denial at first then a fear you know then absolute chaos and soon comes a period of acceptance and adaptation and change right um so no other business our business is not very different from others in the sense that the consumers are shared and people go through these stages and something that swiggy for instance had to work very hard was in understanding each of the stage and reacting specifically to it and sometimes not just realizing what stage you are in but sometimes planning ahead and deciding what is the stage that's coming up post so if it was a lockdown stage you know we had to quickly put a lot of things together we took a day off to train our staff on all the protocols made sure that the basics are set well include including insurance and the likes to support the delivery partners rework the supply chain to bring in um, different pointers of safety right and then we had to understand what is the semiotics of safety like uh, what does safety mean to consumers visually what are the cues what are the cues you can have in terms of every contact point in terms of bringing that to life right and then um, you know we had to expand certain categories quickly across india all of a sudden you are present in close to um, you know 300 and later up to 500 cities on crossover so a lot of our messaging was also very direct at this point of time because people are still in a state of paranoia fear you have to be very functional you cannot make any overarching claims it could come across as fraudulent or unethical as well right and you would and, and although there was so much evidence supporting that um, an essential service like this will not transmit uh, the disease there was so much fear that we had to be very clear about how we speak but later of course came the period of unlock and then um, a lot of these mnemonics changed right and um, the easiest ways to understand is also um, you know the most consumer facing communication that we had i'll play the most recent film that aired during the course of ip अच्छा स्विगी शुरू सर 
करोड़ों लोगों ने कर दिया है शुरू और दिया है स्टंट स्विगी पे एक करोड़ से ज्यादा लोग ऑर्डर कर चुके हैं लॉकडाउन के बाद स्विगी फॉर स्कोर सो नाउ इफ यू नोटिस दे वेरिएंट a lot of discussion on the process but it had to um you know discuss more on the consumer behavior like you know trust of ordering in you know and there are people who may detract you and how do you like obviously here it's done with a funny take um by taking a jai bad rasa murad's character but of course the idea is to just um you know project it in a very customer centric uh, story and help them imbibe the concept then it no longer became about systems and processes but just about how you connect to the consumers and uh, convey the concept to them now switching over to the more technical aspect of it very often uh, these are respectively treated as the input and the output of any digital transformation any e-commerce activity has to ensure whether it's marketing merchandising sales process all of that has to work on the input of data and the output of good personalization and customer experience i want obviously get into this in a very technical language um would like to keep it um you know pitch this to you guys in a very different angle now for this i'll tell three stories obviously i don't have a lot of visual aids to this story it's a little bit of narration i hope you guys um, connect and relate the first is that of a sales story now in india I think there's a unwritten rule that you come out of a B school, you have to go to the most remotest part of the country, and you have to work in a place with a lot of those human development indices, uh, or you know, or, or so, which are like on a different uh, side from your metros, right? So I start. I did eventually end up making uh, working on some projects like the fastest bike in India at that point of time, but I actually started by selling auto rickshaws. and then when you go to these towns it would be a, such a difficult task at every territory at every state um in terms of storing customer information so i'm not talking about someone who you have converted within the dealership but your prospect right and this is a very specific niche category very difficult set of folks to be in touch with correct because there's a certain way of interacting with them they are busy folks and you will have to like literally pitch talk they don't um, understand what they mean rather than what they say etc and very often the data would be so much crippled with all of those you know the 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 situational factors coming in so we would have our sonal meets and all the territory managers would have their own formats and you would have frustrated leadership looking at it and say that guys why do you have so many formats or why don't you follow the format that we have shipped over to you right that entire chain of putting and building that data together so that you can enable cx marketing was always that huge pain point when i started off in career so what i want to discuss through the story is i'm sure some of you may have been in a similar scenario reflect on the anxieties the fear the confusion the difficulties that you went through so it's that mind state that i would want you to keep in mind and not my story right the second one is that of setting up a business so here at later i joined um, ola store which is the grocery division of ola at in the alpha testing stage which means that literally there's no you know not there's no app you like building everything ground up and then we started sorry i have a ping let me have a look at this okay awesome so then it became uh, then i started thinking like a business owner because if i don't crack this i'm not sure what my job is going to be right so i became very responsible and despite not knowing any amount of tech a lot of tech at that point of time i was thinking a lot in terms of hey there's a content management system there's a catalog management there is the marketing automation there's the attribution how do we make all of this work together how do we bring data from you know the supermarkets and the kirana stores and me build meaningful car catalogs i was thinking a lot holistically and this was a time when there was literally no content no marketing around transformation and being a business owner technically at this point of time forced me to think like that despite not having the expertise so i want you to take a little screenshot of that scenario some of you may have stab you know experienced that and keep that in your mind the third story that i have is that of a platform owner so once i became more comfortable in marketing and you know slowly programmatic started coming up in india in india facebook google became a lot more structured once you had that platform expertise i became a very i am i thinking 
became very different now here it was whenever something happened it was not about hey what the business wanted or what um the other category managers so so wanted very often it became about hey this is what google can do this is all that facebook can do so guys just work it out this way right instead of thinking needs first consumer first business first i think the arrogance took me slowly towards um saying hey this is what the systems are and let's work it out this way right and now let's reflect on the mindset the attitude at these three stages of the story because these are the three things that i always refer back to whenever i have to make a decision at work whenever i have to plan ahead when i have to take a check as to how i am doing so here are the three pointers one of them is we speak a lot about customer you know empathizing with the consumer but very often we don't think about the impact um the change you know all of that happening at a different function you know we have to think through how our friends in supply marketing uh, sales um you know what are their daily issues what are the daily concerns and how can we make that better right the second aspect is about always thinking like an owner so even if you do not know any tech thinking like an owner will ensure that you always have perspective on the right roi the whats and whys will be very clear to you although you may not know how to do it but why should something be done and what should it enable you will have great amount of clarity in it then comes the aspect of having a check on you right very often you will hear um a lot of marketers thinking very much in terms of you know thinking platform first because they may have familiarized themselves with one two three digital technology and instead of thinking what the business wants they try to change their audience strategy their targeting just to work on how the you know you know just to work in accordance with what the advertising platforms have enabled sometimes you are too resistant to change that you don't even want to trial a new partner or you don't want to have let's say a cdp or a dmp or have multi or try out various advertising platforms because you're so comfortable in that zone and you're still there's that little gap between you know the thinking that's there in point number 1 and point number 2 here right and that is your cl clarion call to tell yourself that hey there's something wrong and we need to fix it so um this is how one could look at transformation and kind of uh, you know reflect in terms of where you stand how to take this ahead obviously you will get a lot more practical insights as we move further ahead a lot of expertise is pouring in from various domains um so the key where i i would end my keynote is in by saying that hey the pandemic is far from over right you know and the challenges from it are also far from over they are going to continue but the key thing is that this is a time that we truly understood transformation as e-commerce owners e-commerce business owners or professionals we have figured out hey what drives our success and how do you continue that thinking even in a world where let's say this pandemic wave settles and you know we are all back out uh, on public roads so i'll just close my session but would just like to over give you a quick overview of what's lined up an amazing set of speakers so we have tapan speaking right after this um and giving you a very omni channel point of view of things then uh, ashish from godrej and boys and uh, vinay from amazon pay uh, discussing various elements of the customer journey right uh, about tech, the role of tech the role of closure and you know the role of uh, payments uh in terms of like bringing customer uh, conversions and then you have a panel discussion where i believe every large um industry in india is participating amazing to have all of you all of these uh folks together here and i'll be very keenly listening um and this is what is lined up for today and i would like to close my uh, little chat if you have any queries happy to take that over the window uh, Ekta, do I have to pick up any of the queries? Do you have any? Yes. Thank you so much, Umesh, for your interesting session. Uh, so the audiences, we are open for the Q and A with Umesh. So I have already set some guidelines on the chat box. You need to raise your hands, introduce yourself, and put your question to Umesh if any. So we'll wait for a minute, Umesh, for the people to ask sure. questions. I 
Any questions? Just raise your hand and you can put your question. Uh, Umesh, we have a question from Rahul Verma. Rahul, please put your question. Yeah, so can I speak? Of course, Rahul, uh, you can. Introduce yourself uh, and put your question. Uh, so hi Umesh, I'm Rahul Desai. Right now I'm working as a senior digital marketing executive. So I just wanted to know after the pandemic, um, how the, how you have you know you work on your digital strategies? Sure, great question. Um, I think the first thing that we realized is that there's a much greater need for um, personalization and a lot more thoughtful segmentation because previously you could just communicate to people based on their previous purchase behavior, correct? But it, it doesn't apply anymore post the pandemic to a certain extent because layered on all on top of all of that is your attitude um, and your fears towards the category, right? Um, someone could be a very high frequency order in the past but may have completely changed his behavior today, right? So a lot more of those signals are something that we have tried to imbibe, whether it's through various sources of data, um, and, you know, trialing, testing, scaling various campaigns. So that's one fundamental change in terms of how we have uh, approached our marketing across that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just one thing, just want to ending uh, one point here. So uh, is it like this that uh, from conversion, uh, we are just, uh, you, my, you guys might be shifting from building a kind of a trust in through digital marketing rather than, you know, pushing for uh, downloads and purchase, right? Um, not necessarily. I think we always look at the funnel holistically and there's always due attention paid to each element of this. And we try to time it also in a manner where all of this are optimized. And, and lucky enough for us, uh, why this is also practical is because it's a category which you can um, you know use any day and every day or every hour of the day, right? Which makes it a little more um, possible for us to work close to an aspect which is theoretically the right approach. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Umesh. Umesh, one more question we have from Mr. Navneet Anand. Mr. Navneet, can you please ask a question? Yes, sure. Hi, Umesh. Uh, thank you for that quick session. Uh, just this is not really a marketing question. I wanted to just check as a leadership, uh, what did it take, take for you guys to keep your, you know, in the early stages, especially keep your employees and more especially your delivery agents, you know, motivated connected, collaborating, any special tips or tools that enabled, you know, your internal teams and your field agents? Sure. So um, being a tech first company, I think a lot of systems were in place starting, you know, uh, day one of a vertical, right? So over, a, I think lucky enough, a lot of systems were set up for us. Uh, I'm not sure it applies to businesses of all scales and all categories, but luckily we were somewhere in a good place on that. Uh, then came to, you know, like if, if you notice the discussion always started with the suppliers and, you know, uh, the delivery partners, uh, we put there, we, we realized that it's important to take care of their safety aspect as well. Despite all the research is pouring in, you have to be still um, uh, sure that you're bringing in the best practices. So I think that empathy that spread not just to the consumer, but to other uh, partners is where we started off on a right notch. And that has kind of like probably helped it, uh, uh, you know, work out really well for us over the course of this year. Hey, Umesh, uh, sorry, I'm just going to continue for a second. Uh, my question was more around, you know, with a lot of your workers working from home and stuff. Uh, oh, okay, it's on the to Collaborate, in, in, you know, how did you face that challenge in, in the beginning at least? Sure. I think having a good tech platform help, I think in terms of our HR systems, a lot of things had were very interactive, very engaging um, in terms of, you know, we always, you know, we moved into a very cloud-based uh, collaboration, you know, basically using the Google suite or uh, so on. So to ensure that there's always collaborative work even prior to um, the pandemic, which kind of helped us to continue on some lines of conversations and, and some line of those, um, you know, ways of communication. And it really helped us from feeling too disconnected um, when the pandemic set. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Umesh, uh, one more question. Uh, Ramona, Ramona, can you please ask a question to Umesh? Uh, 
Uh, hi, Umesh. That was a very interesting uh, presentation you made. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Ramona Persani. I I run uh, an, uh, a bespoke um, ga uh, suits for men. Uh, okay. We're part yeah. of a bigger group in Pune, but we're, uh, like we're pretty new and pandemic hit and then we had to kind of, you know, slow down and everything. My question was, uh, I, I completely kind of understand what has to go through to make changes, but what, how much bigger budget did you have to set aside in your marketing to upscale your technology? Sure. So um, if I were to look at larger companies, typically what happens, your technology costs, I'm not talking about the typical uh, tech and engineering cost. I'm talking more in terms of uh, MarTech or AdTech or communication tech adaption is not usually a very large cost. You know, you look at it individually, you one has to like define the ROI and see if, you know, what does it enable? How much efficiency does it drive? And then you kind of go ahead with it. Usually it's not the quantum of that spend that's the problem because all of them will be affordable softwares, right? Or, or affordable tech, right? It's more in terms of defining what it does for you and then making sure that it works that where the larger challenges for, I, I assume for larger organizations. Um, where I think for, um, even for a small organization, I think that thinking matters, right? It's incredible like, um, you know, some of the store owners who would otherwise um, not even like, you know, get any, are easy to enable on, are easily enabled on e-commerce platforms or they don't use Shopify, et cetera, in India. Yes, but a lot yes, of them, right. for example, started using Khata book, right? Fairly right. easily. This is one example where any business owner, there's always a scope to understand the tech and then you can kind of like bring it into your uh, processes and ways of working. Right, right, right. No, but my question actually was, uh, if you had a, a budget of uh, 100%, how much, how much more did you have to spend with all your, you know, the added digital marketing that you had to do your YouTube videos just because of pandemic. Yes, um, you've got me, technology already had your platforms in place, but there had to be an extra spend over and above that. So technically, yes, you would have that extra Delta spend, but yeah. it would just be uh, a couple of percentages and I very think, often. And you, you are otherwise, you know, in a growing category, you're always spending to, uh, you know, enable category development and building of equity, right? So the reality is like any advertisers, we would have actually shrunken our budget for a period of time, right? right. So it, it is technically not a delta above what you spent, but you it. say there is a certain percentage spent that has come additional. Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Umesh. Thank you, Ramona, for your question. And it was great having you, Umesh. Moving on to our next session. Uh, Umesh will be here and if you guys have any question in next Q&A session, you can also ask him and put your questions. So quickly moving on to the next session, I would like to invite Tapan Acharya, Chief Revenue Officer, Arvind Internet, Omni. As a CRO of Arvind Internet, Tapan is responsible for the business and customer engagement process as Omni. He has upwards of two decades of experience working with software brands, fulfilling various roles from market development to business management at organizations like IBM, Microsoft, Salesforce, Akamai, Freshworks, etc. Tapan is an IMM Bangalore alumni, is certified in marketing by Kellogg Business School, and he will be sharing his insights on using Omni Channel to deliver innovative journeys for your customers. Over to you, Tapan, to start your session. Uh, thank you, Ekta and uh, Umesh. Uh, thank you for the fantastic presentation. I love all your advertisements, right from Con Hai Swiggy to the latest ones of uh, Raza Murad. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I and I was having this discussion with Ekta that why a topic like revolution, uh, the e-commerce revolution 2020. So uh, I wanted to put some numbers in place that why this is called a revolution. So let's uh, you know you can't study the canvas without the numbers. So let me give you some coordinates. Uh, India, 1.2 billion plus people uh, as a canvas. There are 750 million internet connections in India. Now that's a massive number. US population is 32 million. So this is more than or close to two and a half times the US population is the number of internet connections in India. 450 million other internet users on smartphones. Now that's one and a half times the size of US population. That's a massive number of people in India 
doing online going online and online is a uh, shopping is an entertainment for people so they consume a, uh, approximately 16 gb of data is the average consumption per user which is a massive number they are watching uh, things online they are wanting to buy it online from a propensity to consume if you see india has 50 percent of its population below 25 years of age now below 25 years of age you want to buy new things world is a is a beautiful crystal to you and you want to buy new things even uh, 65 percent of the population is below 35 years of age and you have a very high consumption demand now in the current trend as you can see the ott the entertainment is proliferated into the tier two uh, cities which means they want a global lifestyle they want to buy global products 97 percent of india's pin codes are now serviceable by e-commerce companies that's a massive number 97 percent pin codes all the i'm not sh saying that returns are also possible but all the forward journeys are possible if you see from a shipment perspective e-commerce is shipping a hundred million approximately 100 million shipments every month which is 1.2 billion shipments a year that's a massive number of shipments if you see the latest sales numbers of e-tailers 55 to 60 percent orders are coming from tier two and tier three towns and online shopping is no more discounting but they want to experience the brand now this is the canvas that's why it's the revolution the droplets have come together to form a massive catchment area or of at least a 500 million people who want to shop online that's that's massive let's look at it that what are the challenges it is creating for an e-commerce player because it's very simple people feel that okay yeah, let's open a website put it online and people will buy online and uh, i'll get to grow my web. it doesn't happen like that your assortment and your demand is completely orthogonal what i mean to say is that you've kept uh, let's say uh, stores in the large cities but the demand is coming from small towns the store footfall is not ha not happening and as you know in the pandemic the store footfall has been hit you've set up a warehouse model a single warehouse delivery model but due to the pandemic the interstate boundaries got broken nobody is able to fulfill those orders from the warehouse the pressure on working capital is ma massive the margin mathematics is completely changed you're paying rental for, for the store but you're not getting anybody in the store so the role of the store needs to change the pressure on working capital is absolutely uh, you know massive due to the pressure on the uh, margin mathematics you need to ensure your logistics cost also is low if you are delivering from a single warehouse your logistics cost is 2x or two and a half tech, uh, times if you are uh, then if you're delivering it from the same say, same state for example let's say if my uh, if i can deliver uh, in bangalore from bangalore or in bangalore even from karnataka my logistics cost is half than what i would do from a uh, uh, then from a warehouse model also we have global players competing with us they have deep pockets nothing against any one of them but then with that home delivery is basic that's elementary people want more journeys than that people want more than just home deliveries and they are not uh, doing this because they want an online discount but they're doing it because that's the need of the hour the biggest pressure on you and me and all of us is time are ya time kahan hai bahar cheez lekar aane ka the the shopping is more competing with time of course there are aspects of risk in the short term but i'm saying this and i'm doing this talk beyond pandemic as well also a store is a temple of the brand if you make a journey to the store you don't want to be in a situation that you don't find that stuff there or you come back empty handed let's say i i have a kid and i have to get school shoes for him or her and if i take him or her to the store i don't want to come em empty handed i want to convert it also so these are the big challenges the customer expectation has changed also uh, as a as a brand who sells something i cannot block my inventory for uh, you know different business models 
for example, let's say one marketplace one tells me you have to block a uh, hundred thousand pieces for me because if my order comes, you have to fulfill it. And then marketplace two says you have to block two hundred thousand uh, uh, products for me. You can't afford to block so much inventory for two separate marketplaces. You want a single pool of inventory fulfilling all channels, all marketplaces uh, that has to be, uh, you know, servicing it. And all this is happening pretty, pretty dynamically. Uh, the shift in mindset uh, as a seller needs to be done because the uh, shift in mindset of the consumer is, you know, taking place. The whole environment is like, you know, become like, uh, it is so dynamic that a Spider-Man is like, you know, wants to chase the thieves, but still he has to read a book that what is the best way to make a decision in a dynamic environment. It's become so much of a pressure cooker for a, for a brand. And I'm sure all my brand brothers here, brands, friends here, brand folks here can relate with this, that how much is a, it is a pressure to take a decision. Now, uh, we have also been going into this decision and uh, we, and I'm choosing my words very clearly that we wanted to have a central plan. There are so many aspects moving on the periphery, different channels, different business models, different demand supply things. But the only way to solve it is to have a central plan. So we created a three point center plan that in the central plan, we need to connect with the consumer. When I say connect wherever the consumer is, we need to converge so that all the fulfillment models are, you know, uh, converging onto a single point. And we need to engage with the consumer with the right data sets, et cetera, like Umesh said, to have a conversation with the consumer. There's a, too much of communication happening and uh, the consumer doesn't want to be bombarded with uh, uh, not required uh, communication. So we created this central plan. And in order to create a central plan, technology was very essential. So what we said is that uh, uh, through technology, we need to have uh, all the API, all the, uh, you know, models. Uh, if on the left hand side, if you see, there could be uh, various online channels, there could be offline channels. And we devised this word very carefully called storefront. You could have a marketplace storefront, you could have a social media storefront, you could have a website storefront, you have a physical storefront. But all that demand needs to come in a single order management system, in a single technology system. That, that system also needs to be connected with all the logistics players. Now that system dynamically uh, takes a decision that where to hop the order. Now this hopping the order could be nearest to the consumer because you know the faster you deliver, the lesser is the uh, cancellation rate. So it could be nearest to the consumer and to fulfill that order. And all the ecosystem of uh, users, of uh, retailers, and of um, logistics partners work in tandem so that all this is working efficiently at scale. So we created this, uh, this, this central plan you know, to work this uh, uh, way forward. And this is how, this is how it helped me. Uh, I'll just take a few uh, examples. It allowed me to connect the consumer where the, where the user is or, or connect to the consumer where the, the consumer is. Now I'll take a very simple example. I was talking to the CEO of Khadim's yesterday and she told me uh, very commonly that, you know, Tapan, we used to open a store where footfall was tha. Here is small, a lot of people are coming. Let's open a store here. It's very important for us to open a storefront. Um, to open a storefront where the consumer is now. If the consumer is uh, on marketplace or on a store, etc., to be there. If it is using, let's say, the payment apps like uh, uh, GPay or phone pay to be there. And also to have a uh, backend system uh, converged and connected so that we could fulfill the order. So uh, you could connect, you can converse, and then you can converge everything in a single place for the entire execution to take place. When I say execution, all three things, A, B, C, which is acquisition behavior and conversion 
to ensure at many different models it is taken ca uh, taken care of. So that's the central plan that we created, and uh, in the very connected retail fashion, we we try to offer this and are doing it for uh, more than seven seven thousand stores in India to uh, you know service many many consumers. Let me. Uh, uh, now, my talk is more about various consumer journeys, various business models. Let me take a couple of journeys just to put a sample there. Now, let's take this journey. Now, Umesh talked about essentials uh, and there could be uh, many, many types of essentials. So let's say uh, India, of course, as you know, is the unique uh, country where uh, browser has not happened, but WhatsApp has happened. So let's say there is a consumer which is on WhatsApp. They are comfortable with WhatsApp. Uh, they reach out directly to the brand on, on, on WhatsApp and uh, you know, see the product, the, uh, the brand, uh, the consumer likes the particular product and they submit for the payment. Now, when they have paid, the brand doesn't wait for the order to go to the central warehouse, but the brand routes the order to the nearby Kirana store. And the nearby Kirana store then does the fulfillment of the product. Not just that, the brand has an option, as you can see on the right shop, uh, right corner, is to convert it into a subscription model. Where let's say, I'm just taking for an example sake, let's say uh, you have kids and they drink a particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, brand of uh, uh, health drink in the morning with, the, uh, uh, with milk. Uh, they can choose to subscribe to it and uh, it could be a direct, direct to consumer model. These models are now possible where if you see the benefit, the brand is directly getting to the, uh, connected to the consumer. The fulfillment is happening from a local store. So it is very fast. The local store is getting a demand. And of course, you are not dependent on your retail traditional channel, but directly are connected to the consumer. Let's look one more at one more example. So a shopper goes to uh, a marketplace. Now, when I'm saying that to go beyond just home delivery, I'm talking about a uh, couple of other types like Bopis, buy online pickup in store, or Boris, buy online return in store, or Boss, buy online ship from store. So all these are uh, journey is possible. You go to a marketplace and you choose to have shipped it from a store or pick it up from a store uh, uh, and the order logic hops near to the buyer and it is gets fulfilled to the person. One more example, just uh, so to speak, um, is uh, you put a QR code based ad in the newspaper, the person scans it, submits for payment and the, you know, the fulfillment is routed to the nearby store to uh, you know fulfill it for the uh, for the consumers demand so many such models are uh, possible taking one more example uh, like if a person visits to the store now this is a very very pertinent example in the current scenario and umesh also talked about it uh, the tier 2 tier 3 towns are growing they have uh, as you must have read uh, in yesterday's newspaper, the agri-economy, the tier two, tier three cities is back at a growth at 10.9% by the rest of the India is still degrowing at a negative of 7.5%. So they have money in their pockets, but the retailer stores are not there in those cities or their assortment is limited. So in case they go to a store and they don't find the product, the retailer, let's say, has an app where they can show uh, all the products, the entire assortment, and the user can buy and get it delivered to the, uh, to the home. Uh, is what a typical case is called endless aisle uh, in a retail uh, uh, language. So many of these models are, uh, you know, uh, very, very, uh, very, very prevalent or getting very, very uh, for days. It could be they don't want to spend so much time on the store due to health reasons or they have a kid waiting at home. Could be many reasons. This could be, uh, in fact, shop a store. Uh, this particular example, um, you know, uh, and again, it is also connected to um, social commerce. You see an, uh, an advertisement on Google or any search engine. You click that ad. You can either choose to get it home delivered or see 
the uh, the nearest store where this product is available and go and shop it and come back home pick up pick up the product and come back home so so many of these journeys are possible now what's the core benefit uh, now i have the core benefit in two ways uh, written here one the core benefit for the consumer to uh, get money many many delivery models to them and fulfillment models to them the great benefit to the brand is number one their same assortment the same inventory is getting powered on all the channels so they are not spending two times three times but the same assortment is getting is powering all channels so they are able to uh, you know turn their working capital faster rotate it faster have all kinds of demand come into the stores reduce the logistics cost and service the customer uh, where they are where they choose to shop uh, in multiple uh, model it helps them clear out their stock faster and of course uh, by doing this they capture huge amount of uh, uh, customer data to be able to successfully serve them increase loyalty and be relevant uh to the consumer uh, and according to their needs so uh, it becomes the central plan as i said a central commerce platform uh to personalize uh, to have uh, you know powering all business models uh now and of the future so that's what mostly i want to talk about uh, the reason i know is that uh, in the last few months uh, i have serviced uh, like this more than 7000 stores and more than 2 million plus orders in the last uh, uh, so fulfilled like that in the pandemic itself so i know this is working very well uh, in spite of the store footfall has uh, decreased but they've uh, kept uh, uh, the businesses up and running uh, some of the brands which i'm already doing it for them uh, all uh, mid market uh, and uh, high end brands across uh, are there uh, so uh, uh, that's what uh, i wanted to share uh, as you know as a common knowledge platform that why is this a revolution and why different business models are emerging and bringing a benefit to the indian consumer ekta over to you thank you thank you tapan am i audible am i audible yes ekta Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Tapan, for the interesting session. Uh, so we'll have a Q and A. Uh, so the audiences, if you have your Q and A, please raise your hands. Uh, we'll put your questions to Tapan, and he'll answer them. So wait for a minute for people to ask the questions. Hi, Tapan. Uh, this side, Rahul. Hi, Rahul. Hi. So uh, I have a uh, very small query. Uh, when we are talking about omni-channel, where a uh, central warehouse, uh, uh, offline store, and online store, all all three are uh, working together. Okay. How do you think uh, a assortment inventory plan need to be done? So let's suppose my means. I just clarify what I am asking. That a customer comes on the website. Okay, and it is showing a st- uh, assortment of. Uh, a uh, warehouse as well as store but there is a different set of stocks available in each store as well as in the uh, warehouses so assortment a might have as inventory store skus sqa have uh, stock at store a sqb has a stock at store b and uh, sqc has a stock at a uh, central uh, central warehouse and user wants to buy all abc so when he wants he will see that all these list of uh, skus what he will see available uh, the stock available at each uh, unit uh, for each is uh, skews or it will only uh, reflect the store stock of a particular uh, store or central warehouse and how the store order will be there? it will be a sp- split order so, or uh, common rahul uh, yeah uh, rahul can you hear me ekta can you hear me yeah i can yes. hear you yes tapan okay so rahul it's a very good Uh, it's a very good question it's a very hands on question so uh, rahul what we do is that uh, uh, the system has a order hopping logic so uh, the consumer sees the all the products together and uh, fulfillment the order let's say if all the three products uh, of uh, um, store and warehouse and different store is ordered together the order is split 
and then fulfilled to the user. So user has to has the option to uh, buy any stock anywhere. And the system has an order hopping logic. So the order can hop between stores and the order can split between stores and warehouse and can be fulfilled. Also at the time of checkout, the user uh, gets a choice. That's these orders are available uh, in store and these orders are available uh, in, uh, in a particular uh, uh, shipping model. It could be same day delivery or next day delivery. So these are options are available uh, at checkout time. Also, the last thing which I want to mention is uh, there is also a, a connectivity between stores also developed. So let's say the uh, user wants to pick it up from a certain store only, then the another store has the option to ship it to the store and have uh, the user collect it at a certain point of time. So all these models are built and enabled for the user. It's uh, uh, not dependent on uh, user or not, not a worry for the user to um, order. Now you had one more question is how to uh, uh, put the assortment. Now uh, in uh, putting the assortment into the catchment areas, uh, you also get a lot of data of where the orders are coming from, which stores are being used as the fulfillment center, what is the least logistics cost landing for certain stores. Through that, you can take dynamic decisions or where, of where to keep assortments, wherever is your demand coming. It could be size difference, it could be type difference, and manage it pretty dynamically to ensure that uh, your business is profitable. That's what we're doing, Rahul. Okay, thanks, Tapan. Thank you, Tapan. Uh, so uh, do we have any questions? We can take one more question quickly and move to uh, Ashish session, the next one. So audiences, any questions from your end? Uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Storch Consultancy. Uh, if you can introduce your name uh, and please put your question to Tapan very quickly. Right. Uh, hi, this, hi, Tapan. This is Himanshu. I had one question that uh, when we say omni-channel fulfillment, right, wherein a particular product being ordered for a particular, uh, say, brand. Okay, so the... Uh, the seller would be the brand, not the respective retail store or Krana store, you know, from where the order is ultimately being fulfilled. The idea is this brand needs to have, you know, maybe footprints or their uh, business premises at respective store location. Why? Because the fulfillment per se is happening uh, from nearby Krana store. However, this particular product is being sold by the brand who may be located. So let, let's take an example here. Let's say a customer in Delhi uh, gets the product fulfilled uh, from a nearby Grana store, say one kilometer away from his place. But this product is being sold by a brand sitting in Mumbai, you know, Maharashtra for that matter. So how, how in omnichannel this would work? Wherein uh, this Grana store should be a business premises for a Mumbai brand for that matter. Sure, absolutely. It's a fantastic question. So uh, I, we've been doing this. Let me just take two, three examples here. So there could be uh, Cocoa models, company owned, company operated or Fofo models. We've been doing it for both Cocoa and Fofo models um, and uh, or even shopping shops where the product is uh, there at a, a particular location and the brand is uh, uh, there at a central location. Uh, generally, also in some cases, the brand has a nodal bank account. So when the payment happens to the consumer, uh, the payment happens in the brand's nodal bank account, and then the uh, uh, the Kirana store or the uh, franchisee stores uh, uh, does a, a reconciliation or a settlement. Through that mechanism, uh, it is fulfilled. Uh, what uh, also, what I'm assuming is the brand also has footprint in various cities or they are expanding, they have expanded into uh, various cities. Another model that we are doing for some of the brands is they have dark stores. So they have dark stores uh, which are in various cities and uh, again the fulfillment option from the dark store at, is, is at much cheaper rate than an interstate or a single warehouse model. So that's how we are doing it for uh, many, many brands. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tapan. Uh, thank you, Tapan, for your session. And uh, Tapan would be here only and we might take a few more questions later part uh, in the panel. He's sitting, he's also in the panel. So we we'll look forward to Tapan to answer a few more questions uh, from your end. Thank you so much, Tapan. Uh, thank you, Ekta, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you to everyone for patiently listening to me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. Now quickly moving to our third session, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ashish Jain, Head of E-Commerce and Digital Marketing, Godrej and Voice Manufacturing Company Limited. To speak about him, Ashish has played pivotal role in many big transformation initiatives during his 20 years career in both online and offline space. Currently leads omni-channel growth and digital marketing for Godrej Interior. He has launched e-commerce business for two Mark Indian brands, Reliance and Godrej. Passionate towards building and nurturing customer-centric business. And he will be sharing his insights on fueling massive growth with latest technology that empowers the e-business. Over to you, Ashish, to start your session. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to this session on actually a revolution of e-commerce. So uh, I will just put my presentation and uh, uh, is it visible? Yes, Ashish, yeah. Okay, great. So uh, now actually, uh, I really want to actually us to go a little deep into what is happening into this whole e-commerce and omni-channel space. And why it is like as uh, as professionals worth to actually invest our time and energy there. You see, global e-commerce it reached four point will reach four point two trillion dollar, and it will be sixteen percent of the total sales this year. If you see five years back, it was nowhere. So, so from a stupendous growth perspective, it offers actually an enormous opportunity to brands, people and whoever is actually associated with the entire ecosystem to grow with the exponential growth. Uh, H&M, which is the world's second largest fashion retailer after Zara, their online sales contribution in H1 is 28% is as compared to 16% which used to be earlier. And uh, just one more leave from Salesforce Vice President of Industry Strategy and Insights for Retail and Customer Goods. His statement is it took 20 years for online penetration to reach about 15%. And in one year, that will skyrocket up to 30%. So just see the enormous opportunity which is presented to all of us. And what is actually this whole e-commerce revolution is about. Now, coming back to our own market, which is India. So Technopack, which is again an esteemed management consultancy estimates that the 15% CG, CAGR to reach 18% of the total retail share by 2025, which is organized retail, both your modern retail and e-commerce. But it is largely led by a growth in e-commerce whose share in total retail will reach 7.6% and it will be close to $90 billion by 2025. So the growth opportunity is not uh, huge globally, but it is actually enormous in India also. And again, one more industry estimate, uh, online commerce is expected to touch $200 billion by 2028. So just see another three years and everyone is talking about adding another $100 billion. So this is the size of the opportunity. But why that opportunity? I will just uh, quickly actually go through that why this opportunity will come and uh, the customer and then I will talk about what is happening in the latest space uh, where we are talking about what is revolutionizing the entire industry. Now, oh, there are 560 million internet users. India is the second largest online market. And it is only after China. And many, many more users, not only from the metro and tier one cities, many uh, users are actually added from the tier two and tier three cities also. And uh, you really see uh, from the data usage perspective also, it is almost like 12 GB per month. And people are consuming video. Data rates are falling smartphone prices are falling. So when this entire thing happens, people will consume more and more content online, more and more actually uh, on mobiles. So which will fuel the e-commerce because earlier, if you want to go to a store, you have a limitation that, okay, you will decide on time, you will decide on the occasion, but e-commerce, you just actually pick up your phone and start shopping. Now, uh, India, if you see from a, a demographics perspective also, 18 to 30, 35 is the biggest segment for online purchase. And we are actually in this country where this segment is biggest. Second is the rural customer penetration. I think in the previous, uh, previous speaker was also talking about uh, what sort of business is coming from tier two and tier three cities. 
and sales event this time you will find that uh, every uh, marketplace is talking about 50% 60% actually new users coming from the tier 2 tier 3 cities and that whole growth is actually happening there where the impact of pandemic if you really see right now also is not so high and there the levels of growth are much higher from uh, from a perspective of actually getting entry into this market of a segment which has got lot of wealth but don't have access to market of course effort, uh, availability of the product is increasing range is increasing and uh, i'm sure like we all know that there are a couple of examples where people talk about people in punjab buying mercedes more than actually maybe people in delhi if you compare in certain uh, parameters so all those things are there so lot of growth is actually coming from rural market and one more uh, biggest contributor is this vernacular language because earlier it was limited to only english speaking population now slowly and slowly the vernacular population is also getting exposed to these means of actually buying because lot of lot of uh, innovations are happening at that side people are consuming media in their own language and hence this opportunity for selling and buying also uh if you see i mean like in past maybe 8 uh, to 10 years it was more about electronics fashion and now categories like furniture jewelry they are also getting actually more and more e e e-commerce e e friendly and e-commerce customers are also buying them because it's a it's actually a behavioral change people start with a lower price transaction they don't want to take much of risk then over a period of time they keep on uh they keep on actually evolving and buying something which probably is a bigger item i mean uh, a few years before no one can think about actually maybe buying a bed or sofa without actually seeing it in a physical store today people are buying and of course right now they may not want to go to store but apart from that otherwise also they are buying from a from almost 3 to 5 years time period now grocery uh, which was earlier like uh, the contribution was minuscule in the entire Uh, e-commerce now it is growing by leaps and bounds yes people don't want to go out but at the same time if you see it's a very transactional shopping you go to a shopping you go to a grocery store you buy things from there based on certain list which you have and then you spend a lot of qualitative time there now if you have the option of actually getting the same stuff at your door stop door step then the entire thing changes and that is what is happening in the grocery space Uh, even in uh, us uh, of course the grocery uh, online grocery is increasing but at the same time analysis says that 50% of the customers will not go back buying and going to store even after pandemic is over so uh, i think a lot of things are happening on the different category side and the biggest differentiator if you really see is the fulfillment now uh, people are comfortable with returns customer support is very good earlier if you buy an online order the the biggest the big Hello, am I audible? I think we lost Ashish. Yeah, can I? Ekta, you are audible. We have lost Ashish. Yes, yes, yeah, we have lost think, Ashish. Yes, yes. Think I think we lost Ashish. Okay. Uh, so we'll uh, wait for uh, just few seconds for him to log in. Will that work? That should be good. Yeah, sure. Yes, sure. yes. We'll ask him to rejoin. Yeah. Yes, there is a bad connectivity. That's the reason we lost him. Okay. I'm just waiting for him to rejoin if he can, or uh, we can take a little session little after afterwards. You know. so uh, meanwhile uh, we are waiting for ashish to join can we quickly move to the next session if that's okay with everyone uh, just few audiences if you can just let me know so that we don't uh, waste much time on that
Yeah, sure. We can move on. Yeah, please. Yes. We can move on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll have Ashish joining in later on. So sorry, I think I got disconnected. Oh yes. Okay, Ashish, you're here. Yes, Ashish. Yes, please. So, uh, okay. No since worries, Ashish. Yeah, sincere apologies. Actually, I got disconnected. I don't know why. So yeah, uh, Ashish, uh, we can uh, yeah just a request. We can quickly uh, uh, finish the session uh, because uh, Mr. Vinay is waiting and he needs to be uh, going to some other meeting. So what I will do, I will take maybe probably another uh, uh, two three minutes. Perfect. Perfect. If there's a question, then we can actually talk about that. Please continue, Ashish. Please continue. So what is actually, if you really see the artificial intelligence is something which is driving this change and uh, machine learning. So if you as a customer buy something today and if you have a pattern, then a very uh, synchronized uh, communication can happen to you so that we all like the way we actually buy. We can company, we as a companies also can target customer well and see that uh, what sort of, what sort of products customers are looking for. And they can even not only sell, they can actually plan their inventory also on the basis. So artificial intelligence is one thing which will drive this entire revolution. Now, if I see the Accenture model, if you really say, uh, are you guys able to see my presentation or no? No, no but we cannot see it. You'll have to connect no, to Okay. So uh, I'll just talk about it. Maybe I think there are in Accenture model, there are actually three things. So one is sense. Sense is like, suppose if you have a sensor, so sensor can be like a vision sensor. Sensor can be the way people are communicating with their mobiles on uh, Google. Once you have these inputs available with you, then you comprehend it. And when you comprehend it, you try to make sense of it. So that's the reason like if you're talking in maybe a vernacular language and, and not talking about uh, maybe uh, is pulses, if you say dal also, that also is understood by the system because customer is looking for that. So a lot of comprehension happens that way. And then final thing is actually act. So when we talk about act based on your requirement, then actually customer uh, is served by the options. So this is what actually a typical model, which is suggested by Accenture and then most of the organizations and uh, are actually using it, which is helping the e-commerce journey. E-commerce is all about personalization, all about actually making sure that the things customer is looking for is actually served to them in very, in almost like milliseconds of time. The third big trend, if you really see is more about augmented reality. See certain categories like furniture, Jewelry, people were not able to buy earlier. The reason was they were not comfortable with the entire experience and they were looking for more, uh, more uh, questions and queries they have in mind. Now, this piece of technology, which is augmented reality, is solving most of the problems. A lot of actually uh, service organizations already started using it. A lot of things are happening in the marketing field. But the major uh, usage of this technology in the in in the field where people are not still in the double mind of actually buying i think that is something which definitely augmented reality can solve and especially in the in the categories like furniture jewelry and 35 percent of the people are still saying that okay we want actually an experience so that we can buy online rather than actually going to store to just solve those one or two queries now of course i spoke about the natural language processing also this is one big trend which is actually happening in this industry and that will drive the next level of uh, growth. Voice search, conversational commerce, like you're not, you're actually talking to a, uh, to a person, not to a boat. That is sort of the technology which is coming into picture. And we can't actually maybe completely uh, replace humans with bots, but after a certain level of actually questioning, the manual intervention can happen and the experience can be much better. Apart from that, the video commerce is something which is taking shape and this entire change is not happening only in B2C space, but it is actually happening in B2B space also. Since we are in both B2B and B2C category, I can tell you so much of evolved customers are now coming to B2B where organizations also want to actually see products in a different manner before taking a buying decision. So in my opinion, these all trends which we can see 
is revolutionizing the entire industry and the numbers which everyone is predicting will definitely be like in future uh, industry will achieve those numbers which presents a huge opportunity to all of us as professionals as organizations i think since in the positive of the time i will close my uh, presentation here okay thank you mr ashish uh, for uh, your presentation so audiences we have mr ashish and we are open for q and a so if you have your questions please put them to ashish and by raising your hands Yes, Rahul, please put your question to Ashish. Uh, hi, Ashish. Thanks for the wonderful session. Ashish, I just want to uh, understand uh, from a digital marketing point of view in terms of campaign management, um, how much things will move towards automation? Like there will be API, even if you see there are plenty of API software are there, uh, whether it's Ad Yogi and um, some other. So, what is the future? Uh, is it like that later on there is a very uh, minimum intervention of uh, human? It will be total uh, automation driven. So, I mean, like if, at least if I think about three to five years time period, uh, the automation Hello? will happen on uh, on transactional things. So, suppose I will give you an example. Hello, Rahul, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, Ashish. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm able to hear you. So Rahul, Please continue. I was saying that if you see three to five years time period, in three to five years time period, whatever is transactional will actually be will get into automation mode. So uh, you are deciding maybe on the, uh, say example, if I am talking about, say typically a very simple example of an emailer. So emailer, right now you are planning a lot of things. Entire right. thing will be automated. But if you think about relevance of communication, I think that is something which is still I think humans have to manage. But at the same time, the other level of automation will be uh, say right now everyone talks about the buyer personas, and we I think after research we come to two or three buyer personas. But I think that thing will be a thing of past in coming three to five years because using AI and ML you can generate maybe five thousand buyer personas, and you can serve to each and every. such persona in a very different manner so humanly that will not be possible and hence that will actually be automated so does that answer your question rahul right right, right. thanks ashish yeah thank you so much ashish uh, for your time and sharing interesting insights now quickly moving on to the next session i would like to invite mr vinay choleti head in store payments amazon pay to speak about vinay He currently heads offline payments at Amazon Pay. He is a veteran in the payment ecosystem with past experiences across organizations, across geographies like Citibank, American Express, and Maastricht Bank. When it comes with a gamut of experience across fintech, consumer payments, and e-commerce, spanning verticals such as sales, business development, product management, portfolio management, and risk management, he has been honored as one of the 50 most influential payments professional. in india in 2020 and also a deep tech mon mentor with nascom and he will be sharing his insights on building and optimizing on a digital payment strategy for maximum conversions and happy customers over to you vinay to start your presentation thank you ekta thank you so much good morning everybody uh, i'm sorry uh, i have to jump off at 12:30 uh, so pardon me if i'm rushing with my slides uh, i'm trying to share my screen just let me know if you're able to see that yeah Visible? yes yes vinay got it yeah so i uh, ekta told me that it's important to address uh, payments and e-commerce in one single uh, context especially in the in the context of the current environment which is covid so i thought this was the best way to start uh we say change is the only constant but in given in the current environment i think e-commerce and digital payments are going to be another constant for the next uh, you know one or two decades uh and going forward anyways it's going to be automation and robotics so it's a very bright future for e-commerce and digital payments going forward and uh, uh when when we say e-commerce i think a lot of people think about e uh, amazon or flipkart or uh, 
you know any other larger uh, website like that but e-commerce i would say is nothing but you know your physical commerce that has been converted into electronic commerce and that apparently has received a significant boost in the covid environment because whatever physical commerce was happening until recently a lot of people have started now adopting digital ways of getting into the uh, the e-commerce environment so your local shops your restaurants your your local vegetable vendor everybody is now a part of the e-commerce ecosystem in some way or the other so what we are trying to say is e-commerce is not just limited to larger brands like amazon flipkart it is now much more pervasive across uh, segments across uh, across categories and across merchant profiles so yeah so just trying to um, get a glimpse of what people are buying online and this just does not include uh, amazon or anything it is across uh, physical as well as e-commerce stores which have gone online what are customers buying during this period right which is which is uh, the covid period how the how the numbers have moved so the food and beverage has moved by 7.2% gifts and specialty has moved by 18.9% and this has seen a specific increase during uh, the diwali season and during the festive season from dashera because people could not go visit each other so a lot of uh, gift and shopping happened on the e-commerce sites or uh, sending it from your local shops or doing a whatsapp shopping and sending people gifts and stuff like that apparels and accessories has gone uh, has gone up by 14.3% again owing to the festive season and covid toys and games kids don't have any place to go so a significant amount of sh shopping for kids and games has moved into online uh, a lot of the hamleys and these places are currently uh, not having the footfalls that you want to see right then uh, home and garden uh, it's this is very surprising because with so many people working from home and having a lot of time at their hand uh, a lot of people have started pursuing new hobbies so home and garden has seen a significant amount of improvement in uh, in the this thing and what people are not buying is this one travel has gone down so 77% decrease in luggage as a category cameras and equipment because people don't have anywhere to go no holidays nothing so 64% drop in cameras and equipment swimwear all swimming pools in colonies uh, public places have completely closed so that is fallen gym bags has fallen down store fixtures and displays has fallen down so because people are not entering any of the stores so so that's the that's the context i want to set on what is happening with e-commerce and what are the different categories that you will see going forward seeing a significant amount of increase so in the context of that in the context of changing consumer behavior which is the first two slides that i have shown how are businesses kind of shaping up right uh, first of all bricks to clicks that means as i said all your physical stores are now able to go online either through whatsapp or there are a lot of smaller uh, startups which have come in the space which are now digitizing uh, your retail stores your vegetable vendors so that e-commerce sales has gone up by 25% the second is the bopis or curbside delivery which is basically you uh, order ahead go and uh, uh, pick it up from the store right uh, so that's called curbside delivery so Shop shoppers get orders with less contact and uh, a lot of customers now want to order ahead uh, and get a notification on their app saying that the order is ready and then they will go and pick up the order then the third is pivot to products which the customers are buying so a lot of this has actually changed the way people are now selling products and there are new businesses that have sprung up in the last Six months, which are primarily selling products which are COVID-related or lockdown-related. So, like the face masks and uh, your sanitizers have suddenly increased by five x. And the numbers I am quoting are nothing specific to Amazon per se because I work there, but it's across the e-commerce industry since we monitor uh, it across the industry. So, given all this, right, with so much of commerce moving into the digital space, the most important thing for customers is how do I pay, right? Uh, earlier i was using cash now suddenly everything has moved online i don't want to deal in cash so how do i go ahead and pay and how do i trust the payment system and how do i uh, ensure that it is easily accessible to me right so that brings me to the next slide so what is happening in payments and is cash still the king right so before covid this is how the statistics used to look and this was a study done by visa it says 
cash, 85% of the value being transacted is still cash. 70% of the e-commerce orders are uh, cash on delivery. But the problem with cash, it is extremely expensive. The, so you, you go pay a cash to a e-commerce guy or uh, you pay cash at doorstep delivery or you pay cash to your local vendor. The cost of handling cash is more than actually the value of the cash. It comes with a, uh, almost two to 3%. For example, if you're paying somebody hundred rupees to buy a product, he needs to spend two to three rupees to just handle that cash. When I say handling that cash, it includes storing it, security, going to the bank, depositing it, maintaining his accounts, uh, paying the bank for his passbook uh, entries and all this stuff. So this is a very, very expensive uh, commodity cash. So on a macroeconomic level, it costs almost 1.7% of the GDP. And third, and the last and the most important during this particular uh, uh, time, which is the COVID time, if you look at this study was done in 2016 and you would, it, it's like deja vu, right? I mean, it's, it's somebody predicted that this is going to happen and cash is really dirty. So to have written something like this. So cash comes with a lot of bacteria virus and that's the reason why people don't want to handle cash, right? So that's the, that's the story of cash. And is replacing cash easy? We tried many things. Demonetization happened. There was huge hue and cry on whether demonetization was successful. Other uh, ne aapko bevku banaya and all that stuff. There are a lot of things that happened across the country. But demonetization had its impact, uh, which was not very visible in the economy because demonetization was triggered or targeted to people who were holding a lot of money which was not in circulation at that point in time and they had to completely they were stashing that money and it had, it had to vanish overnight uh, because they couldn't use it anywhere they neither they can, could they bring it into the banks right uh, so that's that's one of the advantages of demonetization which was not very visible uh, but there's a lot of criticism but uh, what has come in the public domain is how much of the cash has actually come back into the system and uh, what has happened uh, so assuming these numbers are true that means cash has come back into the system. Now for cash to go back, we needed a pandemic, right? That was the only forcing factor which could, which could motivate all of us to not use cash and shift to digital payments. So what has this led to? So a consumer survey recently said during the COVID period that you know 9% of the customers completely shifted to digital payments. 33% of the customers have started preferring digital payments over cash. So most of their payments now happened in uh, more happen in digital payments. So the digital payments is there to stay. E-commerce is there to stay. The, the, the trends are in the positive direction. And uh, what we need to do now is since the winds are already flowing in the right direction, you need to focus on creating the right strategies for a great customer experience and a happy customer experience. And what is that going to look like, right? So what is required for digital payments to click? The strategy for conversions and happy customers. So every business has something called as core inputs. There are inputs. If you do the inputs the right way, then you get the right outputs. The, the important thing with payments or for that matter, any business is if you identify the right inputs, no matter whether it's a pandemic, no matter whether it's not a pandemic, if your inputs are right, your business will always grow. Right. And that is the reason why I would say, E-commerce has been growing because you've been focusing on the right inputs. Uh, Amazon as a company has always been growing because you've been focusing on the right inputs across the world. Now, uh, at, and uh, this is something that we use uh, very frequently in our strategies, which is, you know, you can define your entire business in three or four things. The one is called selection. The other is called convenience. The third, what kind of rewards and fourth, fourth and the most important thing, which becomes extremely important in payments is trust. Right. So what are the core inputs of selection? See, customers need these four things, no matter what the customers will never come to you and say, uh, see, Amazon, don't give me too many payment options. Just give me one payment option. That is never going to happen. Customers are always dissatisfied. They are eternally dissatisfied. If you give them 10 things tomorrow, they will come back and tell you, I want 20, 20 things two years later. So increasing the selection continuously. When I say selection, it is what is the choice that you're giving the customer? That means you're basically spreading your net so wide that customers don't have to think about you as an option because you are providing every single payment option to the customer and use it. So that means you're using 
cash and delivery, you're providing wallets to the customers, whoever have wallets, then UPI is growing significantly big. It's almost reached 2 billion transactions. That's going to be the second biggest, uh, the, the biggest payment instrument in this country. Then you are able to let customers use their credit cards and debit cards on the website. Pay by points is going to be a significantly large thing because today, if you, there's so many people using credit cards and credit card companies are doling out points and reward points for everything that you shop uh, physically or electronically. So what do you do with those points? While some of us want, might want to spend on holidays and all that stuff, a lot of us would actually want to use it back on uh, buying products because it's nothing but a discount. It's a cash discount that is converted into points. Then is net banking. Then cryptos is very important. There's been huge UN cry about cryptos being good or bad across the world, but I think they're going to come back pretty soon. So selection of instrument is extremely important. Customers should have a wide choice of instruments that he can use and he'd not think about, oh shit, this uh, particular instrument is not accepted on this uh, payment website. I have this instrument, I can't shop, so I need to go somewhere else, right? So that's the most important strategy. Selection has to be wider, selection has to be deeper. The second one is convenience. When I say convenience, how easy it is for the customers to use a payment, do they have to really struggle to understand how to pay on your uh, website or how to pay at your store? So customers are never going to say that give me a really bad experience to pay. Customers will always say, boss, I want to just walk into your store and walk out. You figure out how to cut payment or deduct payment from my wallet. That's what if you if anybody has read about Amazon Go in the US, that's what we've done. A customer walks into the store, he walks out and his wallet automatically gets debited because there is a significant amount of algorithm that goes into figuring out who this customer is and how to deduct that payment. So coming back to the India context, I think customers will always prefer one, one click payments. Uh, today in India, uh, good or bad, we have two factor authentication. You have to authorize the payment, whether it's a credit card or UPI. One click payments is the fastest way for a customer to experience uh, you know, payments. So that's why we've invented wallets because wallets almost come with a hundred percent payment success rate and the customer just needs to uh, load up his wallet for whatever is monthly transaction. And every time he wants to shop, just say pay now and it goes through. Then customers want to pay directly from their bank account. Some customers don't want to use wallets. Some customers don't want to use credit cards. There is a significant amount of population in this country, which does not want to use it. So UPI is one of the greatest innovations that has happened in this country, right? Then there's OTP less payments right, which is, which is uh, close to tokenization. That primarily means that uh, your card details are passed on to me in a very, very encrypted format. I can recognize it uh, behind, I authorize it without even you giving me the OTP and uh, the payment goes through. So these transactions are now possible for amount less than 2000. So that's a, that's a big thing because almost 60 to 65% of the, the retail transactions in this country are less than 2000 rupees. So this is a great innovation that has happened and it's important for you as a company, if you're an e-commerce company or if you're a payments company to offer OTP less payments to customers, right? Then contactless, something like COVID, we never expected, but contactless started happening like three years back, tap and pay. If you look at Samsung pay, Apple pay, uh, very soon Google pay, then Amazon, the, all these people will come up with something called as tap and pay. You just need to take your phone, tap it on a, on a card swiping machine or tap it on the merchant's phone and automatically the payment get transferred where there is no internet connectivity, you can talk sound between two devices and transfer payments. There's going to be a Bluetooth transfer of payments. Two devices having Bluetooth can actually talk to each other, very secretly uh, exchange a token which authorizes you as a customer and authorizes the other person as a receiver and you can transfer payments. Voice payments is something that Amazon invested. So you just say Amazon, Alexa, pay my bills and it just happens. It just deducts money from your wallet and your bill is paid, right? The thing is no cost EMI is going to be significantly larger because customers need choice and ease of payment. Uh, so credit cards have come up with something called as no cost EMI because customers don't want to pay the entire amount at one shot. They want that EMI to be spread across several months. Then third one is buy now pay later, which is smaller credits, right? I get a credit of 20,000 rupees on Amazon. I can use this credit and pay it up a month later on whatever is the balance amount that it's almost like a Khata or a credit that you get to your local Kirana stores. That's the convenience that customers will look like. And that is the strategy that you need to stick to. The third one is rewards, right? Nobody is going to say that, oh, I'll do all these things, but uh, I'm not expecting anything from this company. In, we are all Indians at the end of the day, we expect something in return. And uh, 
something in return does not always mean it is cash back for some people it is cash back for some people it is something that is relevant to them for their future shopping behavior or something that keeps them engaged or interested in a particular site so there are several kinds of rewards that you can look at based on your customer profile based on how the customers are progressing in their life cycle so fundamentally everybody starts with cash back but cash backs are very expensive they start pinching your bottom line pretty soon right then you get into ml powered coupons which is primarily you talk to a lot of merchants and say you know i'm going to drive drive this traffic to your store you advertise a coupon which says if the customer comes to your store you're going to give him a 20 rupees discount so that coupon the customer can clip on let's say on the e-commerce site or website when he goes to that particular store that coupon get automatically applied so you're basically driving traffic you don't have to spend money on that reward the reward money is spent by somebody else and you're getting the customer to your store so that's ml powered rewards but those coupons have to be very relevant then there is gaming right uh, for example i don't know how many of you are playing currently the google go india game and then there is a spin and win that happens on various websites these are games where uh you know customers always want to be in charge of their destiny the moment you start deciding how much reward a customer should get they don't like it but the moment you leave the chance to the customer right they are uh, they they resign to their fate they say oh man uh, i i did this uh, spin and win but i didn't get anything i got better luck next time oh my fate is bad right but so you always have to empower the customer for game rewards then there is credit cards which are now coming with 5x so every instrument per se has to give something to the customer to ensure that he's adopting that instrument and then over a period of time you can switch over to this thing so that's the third most important uh, strategy for driving traffic to digital payments and making those customers happy and the last and the most important thing about this is trust uh, customers will say oh this website is great for selection it has a lot of instruments that i can use this website is great for convenience i just can do one click payments and get out of this site it gives me amazing rewards but you know what this website uh, i don't care whether this website shares my data with anybody else my card details are going to fraudsters my card details are going to everything so the core and the most important input or strategy is build the right trust systems and how do you build that trust every single touch point that the customer has with your website or with your payment stage it has to be very visible to the customer that you're taking care of his data that means you need to show what kind of encryption you are using at the time of storage of the card what kind of encryption you are using at the time of transmitting that data from uh, your site to let's say another merchant site how are you storing that data are you storing it in cloud when you store what kind of tokenization are you using how do you transmit that data what what level of tokenization are you using then there is what kind of security data data security to use and uh, the legal fine print so most of these e-commerce websites and all i don't know how many of you actually read the legal fine fine uh, fine print but it's very important to see where all your data is going to be used right and that actually creates a lot of trust so in 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 summary i think you know for building a very robust payment strategy which which is going to drive a lot of customers to adopt digital payments and to um, ensure that they are happy and they trust you with their payment instruments these four things are extremely critical selection convenience rewards and most importantly trust right so that is that is the uh, golden mantra for uh, a successful e-commerce business uh, a golden mantra for a successful digital payments business uh, golden mantra for a successful merchant business right so so that's what i want to end with thank you so much Thank you so much, Vinay, for your interesting session. Uh, so we are open for the Q and A audiences. So please raise your hands and quickly put your question to uh, Vinay, so that he can Deepa, take it over. Deepa, can I go? Uh, hi, Vinay. Vinay, this is Akshay here. Uh, Vinay, thanks for the presentation. It's quite insightful. Just have a question. You know, uh, what we're going to see going forward is there's going to be the next growth is going to come from tier two, tier three, and beyond, right? And uh, what as retailers we understand that most of the most of the payments you say 70 70 plus payment is cod right and uh, especially these tier 2 tier 3 people don't absorb technology the way you and i would do or say someone else would do uh, other thing that is linked with cod is it results in a high rate of returns right you talk about uh, courier returns that way 
So what what could be you know what could be the events of the slide? What could be a few things that we can look at to increase adoption of digital, especially especially in tier three and beyond, where we're going to see growth. I think one of the things uh, which which uh, e-commerce companies or physical retailers have not done very well is the other enabled payment system, right? I think that is one of the uh, golden arrows that we have in our armor. but nobody has leveraged it to the extent or to the potential that it offers in this country uh, that's primarily because we have a very fragmented payment system in this country banks want to run their own uh, you know prioritization fintechs want to run their own prioritization then there is government and rbi which comes and says that you know there is significant amount of risk that we need to manage we don't want banks to venture out and start doing all this stuff so i think somewhere this all these things needs to come together and that's the only time uh we already have the the right product which is the aps the other, other enabled payment system we have the right infrastructure in place we have the right security of that in place it's only about channelizing these ecosystem players to take that payment system to that place right and so whenever a e-commerce transaction comes from let's say a tier 3 or tier 4 cities today a um, uh, a guy goes with the edc machine the edc machine does not have the capability to sit accept aeps only very few edc machines in this country have an aeps uh, uh, enabled edc machine so i think the infrastructure has to change to accept aeps that's when a lot of these people who have jandan accounts who have direct benefit transfer accounts they should be able to use this without having to think about what is going to happen because fingerprint is the best security that you have so they don't they just don't have to think about it just put the fingerprint and it's done so i think that's the golden arrow but somewhere something needs to change which is i think is a long term effort uh, because some people believe in aps some people don't believe in aps uh, it's it's going to be some time before we get there sure. thanks thanks sir yeah, uh, i would be glad to answer any questions on uh, email or something like that ekta i just need okay. to jump on to another call if you don't mind no worries no worries if uh, no worries i understand avinay you can take your leave and uh, any questions from the audiences please let me know and i can definitely connect you to with vinay or share his email id will that work vinay yeah yeah that's all thanks okay thank thanks you so much vinay thank you so much vinay for being here thanks you thank you yes okay now uh, quickly moving to the last session of the day it had been great sessions uh, throughout now so the last session talks about is a panel discussion which is futuristic views best practices and secrets to scale your e-commerce for retaining customers in the age of covid now i would like to invite a panel moderator mr akshay tandon associate director snapdeal would be sharing his insights and moderating the panel and i would request uh, akshay do you want me to introduce a panel speaker or you want to take that up i think uh, let them introduce themselves i think that will be the best the way you wanted sure. you are the moderator sure, sure. thanks so, yes, thanks ekta uh, so akshay you can take it from here and start with the moderation thank you thanks thanks ekta uh, hi guys uh, hope everyone uh, had an engaging and insightful session so moving on to the last uh, discussion uh, moving on to the last discussion it's a panel discussion so before moving forward i think it will be great if we get to know our panel so you know quickly if everybody could just introduce themselves you know we can just go maybe wherever you can start in like you know others can follow post that sure hey uh thanks akshay uh, thanks ekta for the opportunity Uh, so I'm Vaibhav Rustigi. Uh, I'm with uh, Flipkart in uh, the grocery uh, business of Flipkart, and uh, uh, I've been in the e-commerce uh, industry overall for a little less than seven years now. Uh, have experience across uh, uh, consumer electronics, ads, and now FMCG. So looking forward to a good discussion with the rest of you. Thank you. Hey hi everyone this is Devojit uh, I am currently a director uh, in Cardeco managing one of the used car businesses uh, used car is on the upsurge in the last few years india is also growing very significantly Cardeco is a company which has recently got into used cars last year and uh, i manage their new car exchange business which is exchanging a used car when you buy a new car from there i have about more than a decade experience in media edtech and now in the e-commerce space i also have an edtech platform or uh, initiative from my side a social one called crack that i manage with my business partner hi everyone uh, it's it's uh, great to be here uh, thank you akshay thank you ekta for uh, for having me here 
Uh, I am Alvika Sahu. I lead the HR strategy and program management team at uh, Mintra. Uh, prior to Mintra, I was with uh, Flipkart. Uh, uh, led, uh, supported many teams as HR business partner and uh, uh, multiple uh, led led multiple charters and roles there. And uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Hi all, I am Tapan. I work for Arvind Internet. I am responsible for uh, of the entire customer funnel. Uh, I have been working for the past 20 years. Ita is Hussein joining us? Hey, hi. Uh, I'm, I'm hey, joined. Hey, Hussein. Yeah. Hey, uh, hello everyone. I'm Hussein Kisuri. I'm the Chief Category Officer at Pepperfry. So, been there for nearly nine years since uh, the very start. And I'm an ex EPA guy. So, I think uh, I can safely say I've seen the entire decade in the e-com evolution that has happened over the period. So great to have you uh, be part of this session. Thanks, guys. Uh, just to give a quick introduction to myself, I'm Akshay. Um, currently working with Snapdeal. I am looking after the PNL for the fashion category, leaving apparels. Been part of Snapdeal for around five and a half years now. And uh, yeah, let's get the conversation started. All right. Uh, so yeah, the first thing that we would want to talk about is, uh, guys, how to leverage on the strategies for retaining new customers in the current scenario. You know, we're talking here mainly about new customer acquisitions as we would have seen, uh, you know, growth in e-commerce overall. So say, let's start, say, for mass consumable products on, say, Flipkart, Arvind, and Mintra. How has the tier two and tier three city customer acquisition growth trended? Or is there anything, you know, any lever or anything that you think has fueled this adoption? So maybe wherever you could, you could talk about it first. Sure. Uh, yeah, actually. So I think uh, what the uh, pandemic sort of brought uh, as an opportunity uh, with respect to the tier two, tier three cities was the fact that, you know, uh, I think always the spending power was there with the customers uh, in these cities. But now, uh, you know, it is, it was about making uh, the right set of assortment and selection accessible to these set of customers. And uh, a lot of the new categories came into four. Now, this was like the demonetization movement for uh, categories in health and hygiene, uh, like sanitizers and the rest. And their penetration just leapfrog. So uh, I think in terms of customer uh, acquisition, uh, businesses and platforms, both of them, I think having the right assortment available and reading into consumer trends because what the pandemic also meant was the fact that now in a post COVID world, people were upsizing. So having the right, uh, the bigger pack sizes available and, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, leading that with, uh, the platforms that you're working with in terms of, uh, businesses that was key. Uh, also in terms of, uh, you know, uh, some of the categories in the food space, which is snacking and, you know, the baking and cooking at home, all of these categories, uh, saw a surge. So uh, being available across the right platform was, was something which was uh, key to be uh, there. And uh, finally, I think in terms of repeat, uh, the right catalog, uh, the like uh, cataloging experience for the customer was something which is very, very important. Um, uh, obviously coupled with the right packaging experience, uh, the right quality checks uh, being in place so that, you know, the customer experience is very good. Yeah. Thanks, Babu. Would you want to add anything here? Uh, Akshay, uh, as you started with customer retention, the one word answer is trust. So to maintain the, you know, the trust and to give them many buying options to pick up in store, to return in store, or uh, re enable return, quick refund, no questions asked, to have the best, as uh, already uh, said by WebHub, to buy, have the best assortment to them. Uh, global offers, global quality products being available to them at any uh, way. Also being near to them, if they are comfortable with uh, WhatsApp, so social commerce, enabling, uh, you know, uh, uh, conversational commerce through bots, etc. So all these things we are doing. And uh, the only keyword it all comes to trust uh, that no questions asked experience is the topmost quality. So that is driving the retention. And also being near to the customer, uh, having variable models give a, give a differentiation. For example, in tier two, tier three cities, it matters a lot ki, are, main yahan se order karna hu, to wo mujhe 5 din mein mil raha hai. But yahan se order karna hu, to mujhe 2 din mein mil ja raha hai. 
सो इंस्टेंट डिमांड का बहुत फर्क पड़ता है एंड इट हेल्प्स अस बी नियर टू देम दैट्स व्हाट इज ड्राइविंग अस फॉर अ लॉट टू से इन स्पेशली लाइक अ ब्रांड लाइक पेपर फ्राई व्हिच इज अ लिटिल अर्बन मेट्रो स्पेसिफिक ब्रांड विद डीलिंग इन हाई प्राइस्ड एसक्यूज you know focus on work from home impact have you seen any change in the purchase behavior or have you seen any repeat anything that you would uh, you would have seen different during this time hey uh, so uh, you know while uh, you know we talk about uh, you know uh, most of the furniture players being uh, you know very uh, we actually uh, you know service almost 500 cities so i i can say please they we manage most of the metros and tier one markets uh, and uh, clearly you know uh, once uh, the lockdown uh, uh, you know started to uh, be opened up what we saw is a clear uh, requirement for work from home furniture right uh, right from study tables economic chairs we saw you know numbers uh, zooming in like 250 300% year on year kind of numbers for these categories and uh, you know because customers actually did not want to move out much and that's where i think uh, you know the online space really gained and uh, furniture specifically second uh, you know the trend that we saw is uh, people were spending more time at home they wanted to do up their homes much better and uh, you know uh, they were looking for opportunities of how they could you know uh, improve uh, their uh, standard of living because suddenly you're from spending you know just a couple of hours uh, in the day and you know majorly uh, it's you know just sleeping uh, at home we are all back to work in office so that was a huge shift you know you are spending 24 hours 12 hours uh, you know you are awake you are in the house and you really need to be comfortable so not only that work from home furniture pick up uh, for us uh, you know segments like uh, seating sofas dining all of this uh, lamps and lighting people just want to decorate their home so people were spending money uh, and uh, spending majorly uh, online so we saw a clear shift of consumers shifting from uh, offline to online uh, and uh, you know getting getting their homes done so overall uh, a very positive move for uh, uh, you know players like us uh, and uh, i'm sure you know uh, the other colleagues out here have also called out the same thing so uh, home i think is a very very uh, uh, you know touchy subject with everyone and when it comes uh to doing up homes people like to put in the best uh, stuff in the house and uh, yeah they were spending more uh, and uh, even higher value products now so you know we are still seeing a lot of corporates are still figuring out their work from home policies and uh, as and when they they formulate these policies people are going to set up because earlier everybody thought it's just a month or two and you know they will be back to offices but now uh with the uh, folks calling out that probably you know it's going to be work from home till june uh, 2021 and you know even during somewhere that it's even called out for december 2021 i think people now will seriously rework their uh, home space set up uh, uh, you know uh, uh, space for them to work and uh, that's a that's a good trend to see so uh, online yes definitely once the studios opened up so as we are an omni channel business uh we are seeing footfalls coming back and, and uh, only serious customers are walking in and uh, that helps us in you know a very high conversion rates so for us our studios also have been a big contributor to the business customers and we had uh, you know we've taken care of all the safety stuff and you know ensured that uh, customers uh, know that they are walking into a safe space so for us even our studios are coming back and uh, delivering to the old contributions that they used to do pre covid correct not at all i think a very valid point on the increase in conversions which actually helps uh they would uh in the automobiles sector you know you would have seen like there's a shift say in the bike or the entry level you know car category uh, does it mean that you know affordable family cars interest is growing for lower to middle class uh, 
Yeah, uh, Akshay, uh, in, uh, there are a lot of interesting changes that have happened in the automobile space. And for the audience here, I would want to uh, divide this answer into two parts. One, I would want to speak about the trends that have come in post-COVID that were not uh, so much there before. And then two or three things that organizations are doing both in tier two, tier three cities, as well as overall in order to both acquire customers and retain customers. In terms of trends, I think four or five things have changed. First is the preference of personal mobility. All of us are aware of the hygiene factors now. And therefore, everyone wants a vehicle for themselves as compared to the public transport or the shared transport that they would use before. So that's a big one. Secondly, I think there's a huge rise in home inspections, home test drives. Uh, people want to experience from their homes, even virtual dealerships have opened up as compared to physical dealerships. And therefore, if, even if you want to buy a new car or a used car, people want to be at the comfort of their home and do the transaction. Third thing, this entire space has got a lot more organized now. Just three years back, it was about 13% uh, organized and rest of it was happening through, uh, even if we had to sell a car, we would first ask our friends and family. But now we would go to players like Cars24, OLX and Car Deco to sell our existing uh, cars or even buy used cars. The use of used cars has also gone up by about two times in the last six months, uh, especially after uh, COVID. A study conducted by my organization shows that the used car market uh, is already about 1.3 times that of pre-COVID. I'm talking about Jan, Feb, March as compared to the last quarter that has gone by. But the new car market did take a hit. Uh, it came down by about 20%, which is one of the uh, prevalent trends. Lastly, I think car leasing has also gone up. Now, these companies like a Zoom car, a Pum 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 have uh, now opened up options for people to lease cars for a day, for days, months, years. So these are some of the trends, uh, uh, Aksha, that has come up in the industry. Two, three things that uh, organizations are doing in order to acquire and uh, retain customers. First is everything has moved digital. The leads have moved uh, digital, instant pricing, instant payment. I spoke about virtual dealerships. Uh, all of this now is helping, uh, helping organizations as well as OEMs in order to sell more and more. OEMs took the largest hit during the pandemic. Second, I think the ease of getting a loan, it was always there for new cars. Now, even for used cars, it has become that much more easier. Uh, new car loans were in the range of 65, 75, uh, 65 to 70% always. Now, even used cars are getting financed up to 50% or more. So that's another thing that is making it even easier for a middle class family to afford a car uh, much uh, easier than before. And third thing, I think dealerships. Now, these physical dealerships, both new car and used car, uh, had a lot of physical services. They have gone for a lot of online services, transaction through apps, uh, uh, transaction through the leads that they are getting, etc. So, yeah, combination of these trends have come in in order to acquire and retain customers. Actually. Thanks, David. I think the home inspection point is quite interesting here. All right, guys, uh, moving on to the next uh, question, uh, guys. So developing business models, uh, you know, in, during this time, you would have seen there'd be new business models that would deliver simplicity, security, and seamlessness. So I have two questions here. First is, uh, do we see that there are any business models that, you know, you guys have ventured into or categories that are launched or for that matter, have we seen any categories that have been shut down during this period? This, the follow up question here would be, uh, are there any alliances or partnership that uh, maybe any of you guys could talk about that you guys have forged during this lockdown, which has helped you guys grow or tackle the situation in a better way? Uh, Weber, do you want to go first? Sure. I think, uh, you know, in terms of business models, uh, one thing that came to the fore is that uh, practically for a lot of, I mean, every shopping machine of the customer, uh, people were okay to come online. So now whether it was planned purchase or whether it was top up purchases. So, uh, I mean, Flipkart also launched our, uh, hyper local business, uh, a while back. And I think we're seeing good adoption in that. And that is basically sort of, uh, you know, uh, signaling to the trend that, uh, whether it, I mean, even for, a uh, uh, an impulse purchase where the customer wants the delivery in a much lesser amount of time. Uh, you know, that's a new business model that came to the fore and we are seeing uh, success in that. Uh, another thing that I saw in terms of a trend with respect to uh, a traditional brand uh, like a Dabur, uh, 
uh, was that you know community buying uh, where an apartment and uh, the entire apartment was getting serviced by a van and uh, you know the brand directly reached out to uh, uh, various apartments across delhi bangalore and some of the other cities uh, so uh, i mean uh, we, we are basically uh, skipping a lot of steps in the supply chain reaching uh, directly to the consumer which was another interesting uh, trend that i saw thanks babu tapan would you want to add something here uh, yes actually this uh, uh, this pandemic is a black swan event and it's a learning of a lifetime a uh, lot of brands tried lot of new things for example store to door or store on wheels i saw levis try store on wheels i saw bata c store to door we are living most of us live in housing societies we saw all the brands name them and they would have you know uh, have models reaching out to you being near to you so again those partnerships were forged uh, the technology to enable them because they can't carry the entire assortment to uh, an apartment uh, to ensure that even if somebody buys something it is delivered later on to their doorstep those uh, things happened uh, so for that matter when the pandemic hit masks were um, so much in demand and quality india was not making n95 masks at that point of time so to enable a brand like wildcraft to ensure that their kiosks which are on the uh, on the footpaths or everywhere we people walk on or to deliver their uh, it through their website is done they were making masks at various locations so the inventory was very very fragmented to ensure that such a fragmented inventory gets delivered to various parts of the country it's an essential so for that matter for pp suits also again a new partnerships partnership with bot players so people uh, in india are more comfortable with whatsapp than with a browser so to ensure that buying and purchase models are uh, delivered on whatsapp to have conversational commerce delivered social commerce there were brands which were uh, comfortable displaying their models on instagram and there was a value chain what percentage of the value chain would get given to the model what percentage would go to the warehouse what percentage would go to the logistics player stitching all those partnerships so it it has been a it's been a uh, last 7 6 to 7 months the ecosystem partnerships are coming to the fore everybody wants technology and everybody wants platform predictiveness uh, cdn costs uh, have to be very very predictable so number of partnerships have done number of business models have evolved and earlier when i was talking about omni channel to anybody it was like selling vitamin yeah 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 karenge baad mein aana but after feb and march it's like they wanted it last year so lot of ecosystem partnerships and models have developed sorry for a long answer oh that is it absolutely made sense thank you Hussein, would you want to share some of your experiences? Hey, uh, so uh, you know, uh, while uh, you know the uh, the COVID situation, uh, I think you know it was very important for a business to be a omni-channel. So I think uh, going forward, uh, you know, and actually Ashish uh, in one of his earlier sessions actually mentioned that you know businesses need to now think about all possible models. So you know, omni-channel. was something that that was very important uh, uh, win for us because we being online uh, and you know we are a digital first company so being online being offline uh, really made sense because when everything was shut down customers were searching for us uh, online in fact we launched something like consult on phone that did well so customers were browsing sites they wanted more information and people wanted to do more stuff so uh, you know uh, developing and you know adapting to the situation and being really agile is very important so all our studio uh, you know representatives were engaged with customers they were consulting them all through the lockdown period and uh, yeah it was more of information seeking so uh, yeah i think uh, it's it's yeah, it's important that you know you you keep building new strategies and uh, you know look at opportunities of how you can uh, service customers i think yeah that's that's the thing that i think i, I should have you know added sure sure sen uh, i would just want to add one more point here i think we have covered this but uh, i think there's going to d to c brands are going to prosper post this you know you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of d to c brands mushrooming right now you know we have these mass consumers the bigger retailers which you know cater to a lot of assortment they cater to a lot of product lines 
but they might not have the expertise in everywhere in every product line that way so there are going to be opportunities here so the next 3 to 5 years at least we're going to see money getting pumped in in these d2c brands and you might see a bit of uh, consolidation and mergers acquisition happening there so that'll be an interesting space to look you know look forward to i agree with akshay even uh, our customers in and you know economies which are we don't have a strong domestic demand they are struggling to come back for example our customers in hong kong and dubai in the immediate june to june october uh, june september october period they struggled to come back so fast but india uh, being very very strong domestic demand started coming back fast south korea strong domestic demand started coming back indonesia strong domestic demand started coming back so very rightly pointed out strong domestic demand it will be a strong year for all of us yep thank you kapil all right guys uh, so moving on to the next section i think uh, yeah this is going to be an interesting section you know so what guys uh, according to you what are going to be the strategies to connect and engage with your customers you know you've gotten these customers online now you know where this pandemic has actually forced those people who people who who never shopped online to transact online now so if guys you could talk about some uh, you know strategies to engage and connect with these across different channels uh debutjit maybe you want to go first on this yeah sure akshay so i think uh, before i answer this i would want to ask the 50 odd people on the group uh, have you ever uh, purchased or sold a used car till now just a yes on the chat group would be enough yeah, you guys can use the chat box i think tamara had written something on the chat box i just got this uh, idea with that uh, so shubham says yes we have do you have anyone else you can write a no also if you have not purchased yeah praveen gunturu i know is a dear friend says no uh, if you have purchased or sold a used car ever not after the pandemic uh, ever shraddha says no rahul verma says no yeah and not online tamara i am asking generally even physically have you purchased or sold a used car before this great now uh, uh, i i have noted the answers just one more question before i uh, uh, answer what akshay was asking how many of you are comfortable switching on the video right now you don't have to just write a yes or a no how many of you are comfortable because other than the speakers everyone's video is off how many of you are comfortable switching on, switching on your video right now just write a yes or a no i won't ask you to don't worry but just write a yes or a no and you don't have to tell us the reason also so we have a, a yes from toshika we have a yeah from tamara okay that all, almost shows she, uh, she can even switch it on up to you tamara uh, and i think shubham wrote a yes just before that pravin also says yes so uh, uh, to the question vanu says absolutely yes aditya says yes thank you guys uh, to the question that is being asked i think the first important thing for uh, organizations to connect Uh, and engage with their customers is to come out in the open uh, themselves uh, a lot of times we are kind of uh, putting our communications forward without ourselves kind of coming out and telling that these are the things we are doing well and these are the things we are not doing so well we are constantly improving and therefore not equally transparent and thus stops customers also to kind of have the complete trust i think tapan spoke about trust when he was talking so that is one thing a lot of uh, uh, lot of discussions we have i think even the leaders would switch off their videos and talk and doesn't kind of uh, build in the same or the brand ambassadors for that uh, matter in their uh, in their communication social media is a big one i think in terms of the in terms of reaching out a lot more people are these days on linkedin on facebook uh, on instagram as compared to before because they have a lot of time during the day to keep browsing at office if they keep browsing uh, people would notice but at home if they keep browsing no one notices so some of the things that automobile organizations have done on social media i think firstly uh, there's a lot of focus on safety and hygiene through their social media campaigns i've seen leaders Uh, of individual organization speaking about values of the organization through social media and therefore also saying that their services will also have the same values i have seen the uh, initiatives like family day life beyond work where people are talking employees are talking about their hobbies etc that other people are seeing and thinking okay this is a great place to work for and therefore 
maybe my uh, transaction with this organization will also be of a lot of use the for example our uh, ceo does youtube town halls uh, where uh, where he encourages people to kind of uh, keep responding uh, people across levels to keep responding that also helps and those town halls are then uh, available on youtube for the entire uh, for the open uh, public so things like this uh, akshay have seen in social media also along with the uh, retaining engagement i wanted to answer it in a slightly different manner uh, for for the question you asked yeah thanks thanks david ji uh where would you want to go next we have a question from gautam gautam we'll hold that question till the end of this uh, discussion then we can just take it up web would you want to go next sure yeah as on mute so uh i think one interesting trend that i have seen uh, for myself uh, right now in terms of the communication that's happening uh, across uh, brands is the fact that now uh, as part of the creator you will always have an integration of uh, also available on for example a flipkart mintra whether it's a, a fmcg brand whether it's a fashion brand because somewhere uh, you know uh, people have started uh, looking uh, towards the online platforms as destinations that you know they they'll search for a selection here first and it is also sort of a promise on the fact that you will definitely uh, get it here so uh, and uh, i think integrated communications within brands and platforms itself because uh, if the brands are you know advertising on uh, social media i think the entire conversion funnel is much more uh, tied up uh, very very well across if if there is like a buy now button which is taking you to uh, uh, you know uh, an e-commerce platform yeah all right was there any thoughts here web uh, sorry akshay can i add a small point sure sure tapan please go ahead uh, uh devajit fantastic answer um, uh, i also want to add a different perspective a uh, lot of brands are making data lake of their mm-hmm. consumer for example what is does their consumer want there is a huge also a huge amount of also over communication in the market like i don't know how what percentage of people on this panel would have 100% of smss read we would all have hundreds of unread smss who wants to read those smss brands communicate get 1000 th- rupees in your wallet equal 1000 points in your wallet equal to 1000 rupees go and shop who wants to shop do you know about me what do you want so a lot of communication Uh, with the client with the customer has become very relevant to what you need for example you and i know that amazon amazon prime is amazon paid subscription to a loyalty program but we all pay that 1000 rupees to ensure we stay in amazon prime because we need that and in the same way most of the brands are thinking beyond uh, much beyond our consumer preferences having the right data set in in place and the right relevant stuff in place to communicate so that's also another perspective right valid point double jose anything any thoughts here anything you would want to add hey so uh, you know uh, during the pandemic uh, you know i think uh, the key thing that people look for is you know information because uh, when covid hit us uh, i think uh, people were browsing all about information and uh, you know trying to uh, see what uh, what they can find so as pepper fry we were actually trying to you know build a lot of content around uh, you know how to keep your furniture clean how to keep your home clean we got some of our you know uh, designers consultants to actually talk about uh, you know what they could do at home and stuff like that and uh, you know so so all our messaging actually was around information safety security during the covid uh, covid place and uh, later uh, we you know as 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 things opened up you know i think uh, you know what we started doing was trying to uh, build more engagement with customers on putting things on you know what what how do how does somebody do up uh, their home uh, interiors and stuff like that okay so and only after the lockdown opened and you know uh, people started uh, getting comfortable uh, you know buying online again is when you know we started Starting back with our marketing and uh, in im communications so uh, a completely different uh, you know uh, actions that we had taken to uh, ensure that you know we are uh, we are interacting with customers all through the pandemic and uh, that's that's how you you know you create a very engaged uh, action because 
see, a home is a very enga- uh, engagement driven category. You need to have uh, people, uh, you know, really find uh, you uh, informational. They really want uh, you to be, you know, very, very uh, engaged with them at all times. So I think uh, that's something that we did very well all through the, uh, uh, you know, the lockdown. And that's helped uh, for us because once customer got comfortable, they, they were okay to shop. We started our deliveries, people started shopping on us. And now if you see, we, we actually did a television campaign uh, uh, for Diwali and pre-Diwali. And uh, it worked out well for us. And, uh, you know, uh, I think we had a good engaged customer base. All right, same. Thanks. Thanks for that. Guys, uh, there's just a follow-up question um, uh, in between the conversation. Gautam is asking, uh, what kind of growth are we expecting in metros? He said, we've covered tier two, tier three. You know, just a quick question. Anybody can take it up, you know. Uh, what kind of growth are we expecting in metros when we talk about e-commerce? Anyone? Yeah. It's it's very, it's very difficult to put a number to it, uh, uh, like a 10% or a 7%. It's very difficult on that, but the growth is coming from the growth is definitely to happen. It will be coming from uh, two factors. One is uh, a new category tryouts by the same customers from a Metro city, the internet connectivity, etc is much more stable in metro cities and they are trying newer newer categories because the confidence is getting built up that is first point second point is uh, a new customer acquisition across age groups in metro cities uh, it is said that unless you consider safe to go out shopping with your kids it will be difficult that shopping is an entertainment activity and uh, Events like birthdays, anniversaries, etc., are facts of life. Uh, you want to make it special. So trying out newer uh, things, etc., to ensure that the demand gets fulfilled, uh, this will also happen. So these two factors are expected to drive still a lot of growth in metro cities. Uh, I can't put a percentage to it yet, I'm afraid. Thanks, Apin. That was, uh, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, all right, guys, uh, moving to the next section. Uh, all right, so we've covered about uh, engagement and uh, now the next part that comes, you know, is going to be the experience, which I believe is utmost importance. You know, as we're talking about growth, be it Metro, be it tier one, tier two, everything boils down to customer experience. You know, if a customer is happy, if the customer wants to come back to your, you know, your platform or not. So any, any, themes around it, you know, what can be done? How, how do you want to invest in customer experience going forward? So, uh, Tapan, you want to pitch in here? Uh, well, uh, experience is the king. Uh, we all know that. And as you know, just Hussein pointed out, the kind of content they are preparing even for advertising is no more related to selling something. Ki pepper fry se no, no, it's about engagement content how to keep it clean, how to maintain your furniture. So you are connecting with your consumer. It's a very content driven, content driven marketing based world. So uh, uh, right from an outreach perspective, you're making them experience the brand. Uh, Even from a brand experience, there's a very common case study. uh, You must have read it all by uh, a brand called Nordstrom in the US and they are into fashion and lifestyle Uh, and they have returns policy. No questions asked. So a guy went to their store with a used tire and they don't sell tires. They send fashion and apparel. And he said, I bought it from the store. I want to return it. And they returned the product. They paid him in full. No questions asked. So the whole uh, concept of, uh, you know, uh, trust on the consumer is much higher. So experience is the, uh, is the king and uh, uh, newer channels, fulfillment channels, instant uh, gratification no questions asked return, modes of payments, uh, higher assortment, new stock merchandise being available uh, for buying. The whole thing is very much changing. It's very experience driven now. It's the king. Experience matters. Like that's the statement. Experience matters. Yeah. Yeah. Bebu, anything you want to add here? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have, I mean, I want to cover it from a slightly different angle is that, uh, you know, uh, as a platform, what you want to, 
understand and i think where you want to invest is on the fact that how does you know understanding your consumer really well and how does he or she shop really so i think the next wave of customers is also going to come from the people who may or may not be very tech savvy today so they while they have the spending power they may or may not be very comfortable using the ui of a smartphone so i think uh, technological investment into things like voice assisted uh, shopping something that uh, flipkart had launched for the uh, the grocery business i think that is going to be uh, i mean uh, something which the customer would really uh, you know come to the platform for and uh, shop there uh, secondly i think one of the earlier speakers had also mentioned about uh, vernacular uh, in terms of the shopping experience so for example Uh, availability of hindi as a option or maybe uh, the other uh, widely distributed uh, uh, or rather widely spoken languages so shopping is hindi uh, in hindi for example is available on flipkart as a option today which sort of connects with the customer that you you should not really know english as in doesn't have to be a barrier for uh, someone to come in shop and experience the platform uh, the other part that i want to uh, talk about is on the fact that how do you pay so obviously availability of all of the payment options uh, i think uh, uh, vinay if i am not wrong he covered on the fact that you know how uh, a, a customer would really want that everything from net banking to upi uh, to wallet should be available in terms of the options but uh, i think also uh, as we are talking about tier 2 tier 3 in terms of the new customers and even a lot of the uh, segments in metro uh, it is also about the fact that uh, can you make uh, you know uh, better affordability solutions so buy now pay later was something that uh, flipkart had launched uh, about 2 years back 3 years back which is basically the online conversion of your neighborhood uh, store giving you a khata option or uh, in terms of uh, no in, uh, no cost emis uh, being available so along with trust i think a lot of these things will tie up to uh, how your uh customer really you know comes back and the reasons for them to come back to your platform valid point there so you i would just want to add something to what tapan and vevo uh, mentioned here uh again referring to where the growth's going to come in which is going to be what both uh, you know vevo tapan said that there are going to be people who are not so tech savvy so i think it might be a good time for companies to invest in customer experience by adding a bit of human and personal touch here mainly because say people who shop who going to be engaging for the first time or it's going to be they going to be early stage uh, people who go to shop online for them you know the return process or maybe the whole process of tracking orders might not be as convenient as you know it is for us so maybe just you know maybe just a physical you know uh, touch base with them you know giving them a call that yes if you want to return it or if you want to help you know we are there to help you you know we have bots we've got a lot of automated things because these these guys are more forgiving than you are right if you have a bad experience with someone you are most likely not going to go back you know but these guys are more forgiving than you know you know the people who are mainly in metro people who understand these things better so a bit of investment during this time getting a little bit of personal touch might help uh, actually add one point here sure yeah dev ji there yeah so i think from an auto sector uh experience uh, uh, i have uh, two short uh, points to add one is i think expectation management while delivering experience will be very important now with this entire thing moving online a lot of customers don't really know what to demand what all to demand i'll just give an example for example now if you uh, put the specifications of your car online on any of the websites of the dominant players they'll give you an approximate price of your vehicle now before you go to the store or even approach anyone within 20 seconds you approximately know the range with within which you will get paid for your vehicle that you want to sell or what you want to buy so uh, expectation management at every step will also lead to better experience for for the customers because they know what to expect and then they get that and secondly i think identifying the pain points and can that be solved digitally again one example is the rc transfer bit i think uh, we would remember that when uh, when we have to sell a car eventually after 90 to 180 days you'll have to go to the rto which is a government office then you will also have to pay something to the person under the table to get it done faster that has been happening traditionally now a lot of organizations are now trying to move it online where you can get the rc transfer done through a video meeting and then without any extra payment you can get it done 
so experience can improve i think one by expectation management and second by identifying the pain points that the customers have and solving it digitally makes sense mg malvika you wanted to add something yes uh, so sorry uh, I'll, I'll come to you yeah just just adding on to what uh, you and webha were talking about and when i was hearing devji i think uh, uh, e-commerce specifically an important uh, an important criteria is how we retain customers through ease uh, and uh, you know some of uh, uh, some some of the and and to bring them back to the platform so of course one is acquiring new customers uh, but then continuing to retain the customers that you have on the platform and uh, you know from a, from a mintra perspective we have uh, we have various influencers on the platform that help users even identify the trends that they can buy uh, identify the selection that they can go to uh, there is a mintra fashion superstars with their videos uh, you know of of what are the trends and what is working what is not working and then loyalty programs uh, flipkart has amazon has mintra has so uh, uh, customer experience is is the key uh, customers should be the focus uh, uh, especially in e-commerce should be the focus uh, and every decision i think should revolve around customers uh, is 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 something that uh, yeah uh, is, is was my thought process absolutely man tapan you wanted to say something yes akshay i just wanted to compliment you to uh, the point that when you brought the human aspect of it to make uh, more human and um, for example we know that when someone walks in store the way you recommend the way the a sales person recommends to the product idio chashme wala hai to wo jaise chashma pehnata hai aapko Yeah, you know when they recommend ki yar this is how the sari would pleats would fall or you know when you recommend that this is 511 uh, levis this fits wo human touch ko koi replace nahi kar sakta that's irreplaceable but technology ko use karna ki wo human ko more powerful kar sake wo right recommendation engine kar sake wo human uh, customer ko acche se serve kar sake that is the key crux of technology uh, and human touch as you said irreplaceable completely got it got it up and thanks guys uh, moving on to the last section uh, a little more into you know internal view here you know what how important do you think is talent management and engagement during the covid time you are specifically talking about employee engagement uh malkita malva would you want to chip in here I think we've lost malvika here uh yes. as anyone want to take this up we we'll just we we'll just finish it oh my god back, back yeah she's back yeah yeah am i going to anything on uh, employee engagement and uh, any views there yeah absolutely uh, thanks thanks akshay i think uh, in the in the last few hours we we've, we've heard from all panel members and 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 all of here uh, all of us here uh, right how uh, with respect to what consumers want how and organizations have to continuously evolve uh, to their changing behavior right and uh, uh, when it comes to employees and it comes to talent uh, it's it's no different uh, uh, and and i'm talking as an hr professional i think uh, uh, in in terms of hr it is no different and uh, in the last 8 to 10 months uh, since since covid uh, since since pandemic i think that that belief has only strengthened uh, that uh, we need to be the architects of uh, of three things uh, so like organizations create consumer great experiences um, hr and leaders uh, have have now the accountability and ownership to to delight their uh, to to delight their talent to delight their uh, employees because uh, the expectations of talent is also changing uh, the second uh, and and we've spoken about this uh, you know earlier here uh, leveraging technology and data uh, and and that's even more prominent uh, Uh, for uh, for e-commerce sector uh, because of the influx of millennials uh, who are who are digital natives right uh, and and uh, who have expectation um, of the workforce to adopt the latest uh, technology in fact uh, almost 50% of workers today uh, consider themselves to be digital natives and uh, and that number is only going to grow to 75% by 2025 so workplaces need to adapt the third and uh, the most important uh, you know and and some thing that you and atapan also hinted upon building human and connected workplaces uh, right uh, where uh, the culture promotes transparency the culture promotes flexibility and uh, where where the employees and talent can be who they are 
uh, an environment that fosters ideas and creativity. And I'm, ju I'm just going to take, uh, you know, a couple of uh, minutes to kind of translate how, how uh, what we've done, uh, you know, with respect to all of the above at Mintra. Uh, so we've tried to build experiences, uh, you know, which are consumer grade, which are high touch and technology enabled. Um, so in terms of uh, experience, in terms of learning, for example, so we are trying to move to uh, a culture of self-owned earning at the same time, strengthening the resources to available uh, and, and make them available to employees. So we've in, in the last 10 months, especially, we've consciously moved towards self-driven and online learning. We've uh, leveraged digital learning technologies uh, and platforms like Udemy, EBSCO, O'Reilly, uh, uh, etc., where employees can learn and they can develop at their own pace. Um, the second is uh, also wellness and wellness, which is which is holistic, which is uh, physical, mental, and even financial. Uh, you know, and uh, so for example, we've partnered with M Fine uh, for online consultations. We've uh, uh, we've we've introduced uh, in insurance, uh, medical insurance for same-sex partners. We've even actually extended insurance to our uh, external partners, which is Kirana stores, uh, uh, et cetera, right? And uh, uh, I think lastly, on the leadership and culture, uh, that is something that uh, we, we've really strengthened. That's That's been a learning uh, for us on how important leadership and culture is, how important communication, which is honest, which is transparent, uh, where we are meeting our employees in, in town halls. And, and Devuchi, you talked about uh, frequent town halls in Kardekho, right? And uh, I was I was reflecting on how uh, we've, we've done the same thing, uh, meeting employees every month, uh, where our CEO shares uh, openly and candidly the updates uh, that we have in the organization, what's happening in the industry, what are the things that we can we can look for. So I think uh, while HR is the custodian of experiences, uh, our leaders and our managers on the ground are playing a very, very important role in delivering them. And uh, ultimately, uh, we've managed talent, we've managed engagement through, uh, I would say, three things, uh, empathy, people centricity and honest communication uh, while engaging with uh, our employees and between us uh, you know through uh, through building relationships through collaboration and uh, uh, but of course uh, hinging on and using technology uh, to be to be able to do that actually great great thanks thanks for look for that all right guys uh, the possibility of time uh, i would like to open the you know sorry open this for questions so uh, I have one question, you know, before we move on to other questions, uh, while increasing presence in e-commerce platform, there is always a resistance as to how to balance pricing conflicts between offline stores, how to tackle this problem. Does anyone want to take this up? So uh, I'd like to give it a try and I think sure. uh, somewhere in, uh, I think across electronics, uh, I think we've seen some of the brands sort of for talking to us about this. Uh, as I was talking, you know, uh, I think having a specific uh, e-com selection, which is basically created or rather curated along with the platform uh, sort of helps you as a brand as well, because uh, honestly, the companies, the, uh, the econ companies, they, they fundamentally know the customer really well. They really study the data and the insights and how our customers shopping. So uh, creating a selection, creating some sort of assortment, which is only uh, for them or rather is an econ first uh, kind of a, you know, approach uh, towards that part of your sub brand or even in your uh, main brand as a strategy would be something which sort of helps you avoid uh, and I've actually seen that uh, a lot of the players in the uh, electronics and large appliances businesses have done that uh, really well that certain, uh, you know, SKUs could be online only, certain SKUs could be offline only, which sort of uh, demarcates and helps us, uh, you know, avoid uh, the entire uh, conflict at all. Absolutely. You know, Bob, I could give a point of view from the fashion uh, fashion industry. Absolutely. Uh, on the same lines of what Weber was said, so the brand, especially the bigger brands, you know, when you talk about comparables here, right? If you talk about pricing, they've understood, right? They have to have a separate strategy for offline, a separate strategy for online. So there are specific SKUs that they manufacture just for online business. They call, you know, SMUs in a way. It was, uh, so yeah, so they've, they've figured it out themselves that, you know, if they want to have a presence online, there has to be a differentiation there. 
So exactly do what Webu said. Uh, they have separate SKUs for offline, separate SKUs for online. Tapan, you wanted to add something else? Um, actually, in the past, uh, this has been uh, the case. Also in the present, also this is the case. Uh, this, it is managed at an SKU level as well as this is managed at a, a seller, uh, what I would say, permissible level that what seller is allowed to sell on which marketplace. What I'm uh, down the line I'm seeing is that the brand is definitely more and more looking at standardization of prices across channels because the consumer is experienced the same brand across channel. Uh, also uh, down the line, it's a possibility that through their own company owned uh, sites in a FOFO model, they would allow a franchisee to run offers at from its own store level. So these are the kind of uh, features which uh, sites are driving an individual brand in a fair 4 4 model is allowing franchisee to drive it. So again, it's a very evolving ecosystem right now. So uh, there's no right way, but it has become as web have said, as you've said, it's become much more standardized than that in the past. Um, and it is expected to get more standardized in the future. Sure. Victor, do we have time for a couple of more questions? Yes. So we can take the few questions from the audiences if we have, and then we can wrap it up. Guys, any, so more, have, any more uh, questions? Yes, Rohit uh, Vatwani is already raising his hands. So Rohit, please put your question. Oh. Hey, Vaibhav and Akshay, I don't understand. Uh, government, uh, these uh, all the big companies and online decided that there will be a minimum operating price model. It is right now decided only for mobile into the industry in e-commerce. But still, it is not getting followed. I can see uh, whenever these big companies of e-commerce come and do the festivals, they run the hefty discount of around 20-30% discount on the prices. And when we say that we have to bring, we are bringing in standard guidelines for matching the offline retailer space. So there is though there is no differentiation between it. I think this is good in terms of documents or something. But when it comes to an implementation, it is on a very poor space. That's what my thought is. Maybe we want to take this up as white space, you know, white goods would be something where maybe you have a better idea. About. Uh, so, I mean, uh, my point of view on that is fundamentally that, uh, you know, I think uh, it is uh, largely up to the brands and sellers uh, as to how are they operating on a marketplace. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, also during one of my points is that uh, even during sales, for example, uh, and I've seen this from more platforms now, uh, not just the pricing, I think of, uh, in t I mean, uh, overall affordability in terms of options to the consumer and a lot of the other product exchange, uh, product financing kind of options are something people are, uh, I mean, uh, the, the bigger platforms are playing more on, but obviously I think it's, uh, to a certain extent, uh, it is. Uh, a strategy which the brands, the sellers and the businesses, these guys are, I mean, uh, it, it is an option left to them to sort of work with the platform uh, uh, and, and look at it. Yeah. Right. That's the answer. I think uh, whoever would be in a better position to answer this. Guys, any, any other question? Yes, uh, audience. Yes, Rahul uh, Verma has one question. So, Rahul, uh, please put your question quickly. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, such a wonderful session. Uh, I have a question for Devo. So, uh, Devo, I want to know uh, when uh, in the um, COVID phase, what were the immediate challenges for you guys? Uh, for you guys, when you decided to, you know, uh, shift to uh, campaigns or you know, uh, spending money on digitally or online platform, and uh, just uh, adding it to um, uh, the percentage of budget which you are uh, running on or you have decided to spend, will it be uh, once the vaccine comes in, will it be the percentage will remain same or it will be like this that again there will be offline stores on which uh, you guys were pushing more on offline marketing and all like hoarding banners and all. Hello, thanks for asking. Great to see you after a long time. I think I last met you in your marriage. Uh, but uh, I think first big uh, challenge that came up, Rahul, was the entire movement from an offline to an online uh, uh, online sales. Because uh, automobiles, even auto tech, 
ट्रांजेक्टिंग the you would be surprised to know the business has moved from a 80 20 which was 80 offline 20 online to almost a 50 50 now uh, which is a huge shift we were imagining it to happen over 5 years it has happened in 6 months so uh, challenges in terms of education and movement in terms of the investment is what uh, helped us uh, thankfully most e-commerce companies uh, have a lot of investments and that kind of helped us push in a lot of funds to get the education going but once that was happened we started looking at new revenue uh, uh, channels one more thing rahul one big shift that happened is in the insurance space in the auto insurance that we are talking about we had a vertical there and therefore the shift was easier a lot of people moved towards health and auto insurance so uh, that uh, that also kind of helped in keeping the organization stabilized from an overall pnl perspective hope i have answered you yeah uh, i think my connecting question was that ki now once the, if uh, the vaccines got kick in situation become normal so the percentage which is now 50 50 will it be again 8 to 20 as you guys now uh, quite a taste of digital yeah yeah i think rahul it will never go back to where it was across uh, yeah. sectors uh, this change is here to stay uh once the vaccine comes in whenever by end of next year maybe uh, even then uh, it uh, from the ratio i pointed out it might become 55 45 kind of a situation but it's never going to go back to where it was it's a new normal which is going to stay across sectors okay devu if i could yeah so rahul just to add to that uh, rightly said by devu ji uh, the kind of spike that we've seen right now it's going to come down but the the new the new level is going to be higher than what it was pre covid that's going to be across industry so i think one of the things is once the dust dust settles you're going to see a lot of people going back to their older habits it's just those people who found value and satisfaction in their overall ex- online experience they are going to be the people who are going to stick so going right. forward you see this will be the inflection point of e-commerce in a way so rightly said by devo it's not going to be the the level that were there pre covid it's obviously going to be better than that but we are going to say we going to see some kind of proportion change once things get back to normal yeah thanks akshay uh, akshay we'll take a last question uh, before we summarize uh, so the last question is from tamara tamara can you please put your question to the panel Well, thank you. So, uh, first off, I'd like to say thank you to all the panel speakers. Uh, this this uh, session and uh, the webinar has been very insightful. Uh, my question is specifically, or uh, anyone is free to answer it, but uh, to uh, I would like to specifically address it to Tapan uh, Debuchit and Hussein. Um, uh, so, we we had uh, many mentions of a D of D two C, D two C increasing, and uh, and um, so I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think is Uh, how d to c brands would be able to retain uh, customers uh, in their purchasing cycle because in fact to, in today's scenario we see a lot of d to c brands who are, who um, we are they are available on their own websites but also on marketplaces like amazon flipkart uh, etc so uh, so what do you think is in terms of as uh, as you can maybe you can say that this uh, the d to c secret sauce uh that can retain their customers on in their own purchasing cycles if you have any mentions of good examples of that you know of brands who are doing it very well if you can mention that as well that would be great thank you um so uh, i i see a huge rise in demand in d2c because there is the physical retail has a particular clout of shelf space and distribution uh, possibilities etc that cloud is increasingly getting broken with online and d2c is on the rise also there are certain newer models for retention 
like subscription etc which you would know of or uh, gentle reminders uh, on common social platforms if the permissions are given to you those are uh, allowing a lot of retention uh, not to uh, mention again the trust factor uh, but those things are allowing uh, a good amount of retention uh, on the d2c platform for example i uh, I've used this uh, uh, Ayurvedic uh, uh, platform, uh, which does uh, based on your uh, uh, personality type, they cater your hair product or skin product, and they then you know they have a subscription model. Now that product is so sticky, is uh, it's a it's a it's a D two C model. I go there. There are certain questionnaires, etc. And same brand site and you buy from the same brand brand style of course this is in my opinion is not anti d2c it is not at all anti d2c it is d2 um, in the current world models may not be mutually exclusive you may have the at marketplaces you may have uh, your direct brand site but a, a subscription model uh, a repeat buying to ensure there is certain loyalty, etc. You understand the customers to give the right offers. That is, I think, so is driving D two C retention and penetration. That's my personal experience. Devujit or anybody, uh, Akshay, you want to answer? Yeah, I think Tamara, uh, the question of D two C, I think, is a no-brainer. It has to uh, come up and become big. Some of the Trends uh, and Tapan, I think, beautifully answered in various ways in which it is coming up. Some of the trends I see in the auto sector uh, uh, is uh, you already kind of know the uh, OLX channel where uh, you can actually go and uh, uh, directly get it from a customer who is uh, wanting to sell uh, their car, right? I mean, that's the best example where uh, you're you have a trusted player in between so that you know that you won't be cheated anywhere, but it's eventually one transaction, one customer to another customer that the car is moving to. And a lot of players in order to liquidate their existing inventory are using the D2C model also, where they're opening up uh, their inventory to the, uh, to the world at a certain price uh, that, uh, that they can get it for. So that's how the experimentations are happening in the auto space. But I think that has to come up. I, the need of a channel is going down, given the reach is going up through the uh, uh, through the digital space, and I think it's going to come up in a very big way in the future across sectors. So, uh, Tamara, hope your question was answered. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, we are at the end of the webinar. So before we summarize, uh, just a little uh, this, that we all got uh, some great insights on how the e-commerce industry is always on a ride to the wave of popularity. It's been a challenging and a volatile year for the businesses around and e-commerce has transformed the way business is being done. So considering from the way people shop to uh, the way uh, online business tech is managed, E-commerce is gearing up for some major changes and we have seen that and heard from the industry experts today. So at the end now, I would like to thank our partner Omni, uh, powered by Arvind Internet and all of the thought leaders for taking out your precious time and being here, not missing our lovely audience. Thank you again for taking out your precious time, especially on Saturday morning, uh, making it an interactive session uh, with our speakers, asking your questions. Hope all your questions were answered by our thought leaders. And we will be also sharing your feedback form, which also mentions about one-on-one -on -one brainstorm virtual meet with Omni. Uh, you can mention your interest in, and we can connect you with the Omni people. Sure. Also, uh, it, uh, I, want to, I want to mention yes, a, small, a small point. Uh, Akshay, thanks a lot for hosting us uh, in the panel. Uh, you rotated the conversation very interestingly across all of us, and it was a fantastic panel. And Ekta, uh, thank you very much for hosting us and for sharing this knowledge session. There are two very separate things, the success part of it and the joy part of it. The joy part is what the heart understands. And it is very joyful to be a part of this panel. Thanks, Akshay. Thanks, Ekta. Thank you. Thank nice. you to all Thanks, the speakers Tabu. once again so and much. the audiences for making it joyful as mentioned by Tapan. And we will be shortly updating the video of the entire webinar on the website and we'll be sharing with everyone uh, you can again uh, go through the webinar and if anybody needs to connect to any speakers audiences, please connect with the Brunalytics. They will help you in doing that. 
and please follow us on linkedin instagram facebook and uh, twitter and keep uh, we'll keep you updated regarding our uh, upcoming events and webinars have a nice weekend please stay thank safe you. stay strong stay thank at you. home thank you everyone thank you audience thanks, thanks. 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 akshay tapan and ekta thank you everyone thank you. Yeah, see you guys thanks, thanks. akshay thanks, thanks ekta thanks the rest of us thank, thank you bye bye bye, bye.